Thank you. All right, good morning. Do we have any preliminary matters before we have the chair? Yes, sure. All right, thank you. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Our next witness. Good morning, Your Honor. Um, plaintiff calls Tara Roberts. All right, let's see if we can get her in here. Miss Roberts, can you hear me? Can you hear me, Ms. Roberts? Ms. Roberts? I can see you. Excuse me? Yeah, we can bring them in. See if she's on mute or not. Hmm? She's right there. Can you hear me, Mr. Roberts? Yes, I can. Okay, great. Can you raise your right hand for me? Do you swear or affirm to tell the truth under penalty of law? Yes, I do. Okay, thank you, ma'am. We can't see her on the big screen. Just do a split screen so we can start there. All right. 
go ahead and ask your question. Go ahead. It's the best we're going to do right now. Okay. Um, good morning. Would you please state your name for the record? Tarly Roberts. Miss Roberts, how do you know Johnny Depp? I managed his island in the Exuma Keys in the Bahamas for the past 15 years. Miss Roberts, where do you live? I live on I live on the island and I have a home in Nassau and in Long Island, the Bahamas, which I try to get to as frequently as possible. Can you please describe Mr. Depp's private island generally? Um, my duties on the private island would be to um, maintain the island, the buildings, the houses, logistics, not included or limited to um, provisioning fuel, uh, gas, groceries, um, just day-to-day -day operations, staff, um, and uh, kind of like an estate just in the middle of nowhere. Okay. Um, Your Honor, I would like to pull up Plaintiff's Exhibit 49, which has previously been submitted into evidence. Okay. Um, and Mr. Gibson, if you could play this, and um, Your Honor, if we could publish this to the jury. Thank you. We can take that down. Um, Ms. Roberts, do you recognize what is shown in that video? Yes, that's Johnny's house on the island. Okay, thank you. Um, Mr. Gibson, can you please pull up Plaintiff's Exhibit 348? And this hasn't been submitted into evidence yet, so let's first just play that for Ms. Roberts. Ms. Roberts, do you recognize what is shown in that video? Yeah, that's his house and, and uh, closet area. Okay. Um, Your Honor, I'd like to, plaintiff moves to admit this into evidence. Okay. All right, 348 in evidence. Do you wish to have it published? Yes, can we please publish okay. that to the jury? And Mr. Gibson, once it's published, if we could play that again. And Ms. Roberts, what is that doorway with the beads um, that was just shown in that video? That's the entrance to the closet. Okay, thank you. We can take that down. In his house. Thank you. Ms. Roberts, I believe you mentioned that you manage staff on the island. How many people work with you on the island? Uh, myself and, and three others is uh, Jason Major goes by CJ. Stephen Farrow and Rico Major. Is this, uh, I believe the witness is not being shown to the jury right now on their screens. Thank you. The witness. Uh, there you go. Thank you. Ms. Roberts, how are you compensated for your work on the island? I receive a monthly salary. Other than this monthly salary, what other sources of income do you have? Um, I get uh, dividends and rental from family properties and businesses that we have. Since you've been working for Mr. Depp, how often have you seen him? Um, on average, uh, two, three times a year. Sometimes it was longer, um, more visits. Sometimes I didn't see him for a period of time, depending on what his schedule was or what was happening on the island. 
And how would you describe your interactions with Mr. Depp? Um, the island was a very family atmosphere, uh, dinners together, he was very social, um, funny, humorous, uh, very kind with all of us, and uh, very, very outgoing. I um, enjoyed working with him and for him. When you first started working on Mr. Depp's island, who would come down to the island? Um, it, at the beginning, it was um, Vanessa and the children. Ob objection. Um, when he started relevance. Amber. All right. Hey, hold on a minute, ma'am. Objection. Relevance. Uh, it goes to um, just Miss Roberts' knowledge of who came right. down to the island. We, we can Depp. move forward. Next question. Okay. Um, uh, Miss Roberts, um, when well, Miss Roberts, are you aware if Mr. Depp brought, or how often did Mr. Depp bring guests with him to the island? Um, he had uh, guests. He would bring Amber and, and Amber with her friends, and also I had on one of the occasions I had Paul Bettany and his wife and his children here on on one of the trips. And when did the Bettanys come down to the island? Um, sometime in the summer of July 2013. What happened when the Bettany's came down? Um, it was a, a normal trip. I just, I, we had an incident where I was asked to um, have Amber leave the island. I scheduled a flight for her to leave to go to Florida that morning. And then that afternoon, I was told to um, bring her back. And I arranged for a flight for her to come back that afternoon to the island. When did you first meet Ms. Heard? I believe it was shortly after they started dating. What was your impression of Ms. Heard when you first met her? Objection. Oh, they were very much in love. Relevance. Uh, I was oh, oh, okay, oh, good. Okay. Next question. I, go ahead. I think Ms. Bredhoff has drawn her objection. Yes, go ahead. Okay, so uh, Ms. Roberts, you can answer. What was your first? What was your impression of Ms. Heard when you first met her? Oh, they were very nice, a couple in love. They, she cooked for him, uh, cleaned up. They took care of each other. They were a very happy couple. When, if at all, did that change? Um, with each visit, it, 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 it changed um, more of, um, it was more, not uh, like an island life anymore. It was more of um, wines and, and more, more requests uh, simple things, toiletries, uh, to have things here in place before um, they came or she came as well. Um, so it, you know, luggage changed, we got more and more luggage. We, I mean, just things evolved and kind of mushroomed, um, mushroomed a bit. How often would you see Miss Heard on the island when she was in a relationship with Mr. Depp? I would, on average, every day, um, taking meals, cleaning houses, um, sometimes more. And how often would Miss Heard come down to the island? Um, the, the, at the beginning, probably the same two or three times a year, um, sometimes three times with her friends and family and, and, and Johnny. During your interactions with Miss Heard, what, if any, changes did you observe of Miss Heard? Um, the the taking care of the cooking the meals we had we then had a chef come to cook um it was more of um it was more of a, a formal island um with chefs and housekeepers and things like that um changed um and uh yeah pretty much that miss roberts were you on the island in august 2014 for mr depp's detox yes i was who else was on the island um, I flew to Nassau and, and met um, Johnny, Amber, and Deb. I brought them, flew them back to the island, and then a couple of times. Um, Ms. Roberts, I believe you froze there for a second. Um, I heard you say Johnny, Amber, and Deb, and then you were cut off for a second. A, a couple of days into, a couple of days later, Dr. Kipper arrived. Um, what do you recall about that time that Mr. Depp came down to the island in August 2014? 
um, that he, he was going to be here, they were going to be here for an extended period of time, at least a, a month or longer. Um, and so we provisioned for a month for, for the trip. Um, and after about a week or two, um, they left. Where was Mr. Depp staying for the detox? In, in his house. Is that the same house that was just shown in those videos earlier? Yes, it was. How often would you see Mr. Depp when he was on the island for the detox? Um, I would every day, but not um, face to face, um, just from delivering, um, some re replenishing the house, delivering uh, supplies, waters, and things like that, linens, and, and changing things out. So glimpsing him, not, not a conversation as it used to be. How was Mr. Depp when you saw him? Uh, he was always asleep on the couch. While Ms. Heard was on the island for the detox, what, if any, injuries did you observe on Ms. Heard? I didn't, I didn't see anything. After Mr. Depp and Ms. Heard left the island, what happened next? Um, we would go into the house and, and uh, break it down, uh, empty out the refrigerators, change the linens, collect the laundry, uh, straighten the house back up again. After they left, um, what, if any, property damage did you observe? There wasn't any. Okay. Ms. Roberts, to what extent were you involved in Mr. Depp and Mrs. Hurd's wedding in February 2015 on the island? Um, pretty much all aspects of it. Uh, logistics, uh, work permits, getting things set up onto the island, uh, to the island, staff, um, provisions, um, building of the, the tents and, and uh, organizing transportation of, of guests to and from the island. When did you first hear that Mr. Depp and Ms. Heard were getting married on the island? Objection calls for hearsay and relevance. What's the relevance of when she heard? I, I can move on. Okay, next question. Um, what communications, if any, did you have with Ms. Heard about the wedding? Um, I, we were given um, uh, uh, information on a, a schedule um, to better help me uh, schedule and the provisioning of what would be um, on the island, beverages and, and food and, and things like that. Um, we were given a, a schedule for um, daily um, things were going to uh, happen each day. Um, what time foods were, when people were coming in, how many people would be at meals, just so we, I had a better idea of, of planning of what was happening. Um, it was detailed. Um, it was what was happening each day um, on, and then it was uh, the rehearsal night, and there would be, you know, we had scheduled, like, it would be dinner, dancing, drugs, music, and then the wedding. We were very um, conscious about doing the wedding. The next day, we were doing the wedding. Um, the ceremony and we were specific on time privacy was very important um we were very careful of people taking pictures i think everybody was given um disposable cameras and, and asked not to take pictures um i was concerned about that also but we were doing the um ceremony at um, sunset so there really wouldn't be uh issue with um what paparazzi people and things like that. And um, shortly when the ceremony was about to happen, it actually happened earlier than it was um, scheduled. The bridal party and, and Amber showed up early and we were still scrambling for flowers and setting up and, and getting beverages and um, snacks down there. And there was a plane circling overhead and uh, it would just kept on circling and circling and, and taking pictures and, and the ceremony proceeded earlier than um, was scheduled. Did you observe Mr. Depp drinking alcohol at the wedding? Objection leading. All right, I'll sustain the objection. Okay. Um, Ms. Roberts, as part of the provisioning for the wedding, did you um, 
order alcohol for the wedding? Objection leading. Sustained. Okay. Ms. Roberts, what did you order for the wedding in February 2015? Um, I, was, I was given a list of uh, food. Um, I was given a list of beverages for wine, champagnes. I was asked to um, have Dr. Pepper and um, sugar-free Red Bull here because at that time that was what um, Mr. Depp or Johnny was uh, drinking was Dr. Pepper and sugar-free Red Bull. Okay. Um, did you observe Miss Her drinking alcohol at the wedding? Objection. Leading. Sustained. Who did you observe drinking alcohol at the wedding? Um, pretty much everybody was 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 drinking and, and doing shots and celebrating. It was a, it was a, a party. Uh, Ms. Roberts, I'd like to discuss with you when Mr. Depp and Ms. Heard were on the island in December 2015, who came down to the island with them? Um, I flew to Nassau um, to meet them, which is what I normally do. Um, I meet he, himself, Johnny, and, and, and whoever comes to the island, I fly to Nassau to meet them just to make sure that the transition is smooth with customs and immigration. Um, so I flew to Nassau and I met um, Johnny, Amber, his children, and a friend of their, of the children, and um, load the luggage onto the caravan plane, and we boarded the plane and, and, and came to the island. Um, and a couple days into the trip, um, Alice and Greg and Alice's three children and a nanny um, came to the island as well. Who are Alice and Greg? Alice is a clothes designer and Greg was her partner and I, I believe he's a photographer. When did you first interact with Ms. Hurd when she came to the island in December 2015? Um, at the airport when I flew to Nassau to meet, to meet everybody. Usually when they come down off the plane, you know, there's hugs and kisses and chatting for a couple minutes while the luggage is transferred. How close were you to Ms. Hurd? Close, hug, close, hug, kiss, you know, how are you, talk, same with everybody. So face to face, cheek to cheek. What, if any, makeup did you observe Miss Heard wearing when you first interacted with her? I, do, I don't recall um, if she was or was not wearing makeup. Um, she, she, if she wore makeup, it was very natural. Um, I, I don't think often she wore makeup on the island. Um, I, I, I don't recall her wearing makeup. What, if any, injuries did you notice on Miss Heard? I didn't notice any. Ms. Roberts, you mentioned that Gregory, a photographer, came to the island during that time. Um, how often did you observe Gregory on the island? Um, I interacted every day because uh, meals went down and, 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 and changing the sheets and cleaning the, the room. Um, so I, I, I see everybody every day um, there. And when you saw him, what was he doing? Um, the, they were doing, uh, there was a photo shoot on the island. Um, Amber was wearing the clothes, Amber was wearing Alice's clothes and they were doing a photo shoot on the beach um, and Greg was taking the pictures. What, if anything, do you remember about that particular time that Mr. Depp and Ms. Hurd came down to the island? Um, we had a, there was a incident between Johnny and Amber here during that trip. Okay, can you please describe that incident? Um, I, on the evening, we kind of called it a night, dinner was finished. Uh, we wrapped everything up down here at the staff area in the kitchen. Um, myself and CJ um, came to the office uh, later on that evening and Johnny was um, in the office up here um, and he was agitated, kind of walking back and forth. I'd asked him if he needed anything because I, figured, I wasn't sure why, if he was up here to get something or was looking for something, which wouldn't be unusual for people to come up here. Um, so he was here, we talked for a couple minutes, the three of us, and a couple minutes later, um, Amber um, 
came into the into the office with um, into the office, and we were the three of us were in the office, and, and Amber came in, and she was asking him to uh, tell him to come back to the house. Um, Please come back. I'm sorry. Come back. Um, and uh, he stood stood here, reluctant to go. Um, didn't want to go. And um, a little exchange back and forth. Um, he le left the office and got into his vehicle and started it up. And Amber went outside and stood in front of the vehicle um, so that didn't drive away. She was standing. In, Amber was standing in front of it. And um, again, it was, she was asking him to don't leave. I'm sorry, come back to the house. After a couple minutes, um, she got in the vehicle and they left to go up back to their house. What happened after they went back up to the house? Um, CJ and I were still in the office and um, weren't really sure decided that maybe it would be best if we just drove up there just to make sure that um, everything was okay. And um, so we got in the golf cart and we drove up to their house, um, got into the parking lot and the, his vehicle was in the parking lot and um, you could hear them, in, you can hear them inside the house, you could hear inside the house uh, yelling um, her, yeah, Amber yelling and, and Johnny answering back and you could really hear what was being said. Um, we stood there for a couple minutes, uh, CJ and myself, and then, um, then you started to hear, um, it became audible. Um, Amber was telling him that he was a, a washed up actor. Um, he was gonna die a lonely, a fat, lonely old man. Then you heard, uh, you hit me with a can. You heard Johnny say, you hit me with a can. And then he came down the steps and Amber was behind him and she had a, a bottle in her hand, was removed. And there was a, a brief pause at the moment, uh, I think of initial shock or, or uh, uncertainty of why, you know, that we were there. I, they need, neither Johnny nor Amber knew that we were there. Um, he proceeded to uh, walk back to the John Deere and um, she, again, walked, he was just sitting in the seat. He, Amber came up to him and was asking him to come back in the house that she was sorry, please come back in the house. Um, and uh, he, he didn't come out of the seat and she was hugging and kissing him and I love you, I love you. She was telling him I loved you. Um, he didn't react, he, Johnny sat there. Um, eventually uh, got out of the John Deere um, and proceeded to start to walk away. At that time, Amber started to grab at him and his shirt and, and, and trying to pull him back to the house, um, just, just basically viciously trying to pull him back and, and get him back to the house and, 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 and yelling at him. And at that point, I, I was between them and uh, felt it was best and I was getting worried about what was going to happen and it was best that um, I remove him from the situation and so um, CJ took Amber back to the house and I walked Johnny over to the cafe which was basically 30 seconds away from from the house because it was the only place I could take him to at the time. And you mentioned that Ms. Hurd was viciously trying to pull Mr. Depp back. Can you explain what you mean by that? Um, it, it was like clawing, grabbing at his clothes, grabbing his hair, trying to like pull him back, like an angry, like he was leaving and come back. He couldn't leave in the vehicle because the keys had been taken out. So there, was, there wasn't a way for Johnny to drive away the only way was for him to, to walk, for him to walk away. And um, it uh, wasn't um, a pleasant situation of, of wanting him to, to not leave and um, angry and yelling and, and just yelling, you know, come back, come back, don't leave um, and things like that. At any point did Mr. Depp um, hit or touch Ms. Heard? Objection leading. All right, I'll see an objection. Ms. Roberts, um, how did Mr. Depp react to Ms. Heard viciously grabbing him? He, he didn't. Uh, he stood there with his arms by his side and um, he, 
he didn't do anything. Okay. Ms. Roberts, when you were back in the cafe with Mr. Depp, what happened next? Um, I was concerned because uh, he, I had heard him objection, say that he'd gone. Objection to her being concerned. Because that's not uh, I'll sustain as to concerned, all right. Okay, Ms. Roberts, without testifying as how you felt, um, what did you observe when you went back to the cafe with Mr. Depp? I, when we went back to the cafe, he had a, a mark across the bridge of his nose. Um, I got a bag of ice to put on his uh, on it to, so that it w wouldn't swell, um, just to make sure that it wasn't bleeding. And I, he walked over to the love seat at the cafe and he laid down and um, went to sleep. And CJ came back over and. Um, I asked CJ to stay there for the remainder of the evening, for the remainder of the morning, um, and I left CJ inside the cafe, and I left Johnny on the couch. When did you next see Miss Heard? That that morning, I, I saw I saw her that morning. How close were you to Miss Heard when you interacted with her the next morning? Uh, conversation, um, in in a couple feet away. When you saw her, how did she appear? Um, they had guests leaving and uh, it was uh, kind of a, no a normal morning, um, going down to the beach to, to see the guests leave. What, if any, makeup was Miss Heard wearing? Again, I'm not sure. She. she if she wore makeup on the island, if it was, it was very natural looking. What, if any, injuries did you observe on Ms. Heard? I didn't observe any. What, if any, injuries did you observe on Mr. Depp? The, the marking across the bridge of his nose. After... And um, when did Ms. Heard and Mr. Depp leave the island? I believe they left that afternoon. The guests left in the morning, and I believe they left that afternoon. After Ms. Heard and Mr. Depp left the island, what did you do next? Um, our usual, we go into the buildings and uh, we, we break them down. We empty out the refrigerators, garbage, take all the perishables out of the house, um, and straighten the place up take the linens away, um, things like that. What did you observe when you went through that process? Um, the island was, the island was as it was when they arrived. The only thing that was different was the, there was the uh, liquid on the, on the deck with a can, I believe of mineral spirits or something there next to it, which had leaked out onto the deck. And then in the, um, over the railing um, were paint brushes and um, art supplies, paint brushes, um, paint tubes, uh, the jars that the paints are in, and, and those were all scattered in the bush. Ms. Roberts, when is the first time you provided testimony about this incident in December 2015? I believe it was for another case in May 2020. Ms. Roberts, how often have you seen Mr. Depp drink alcohol on the island? Um, he goes through periods of time where he's been here and he doesn't drink and it's non-alcoholic Bex or something like that. Um, it, it varies. Um, sometimes he drinks when he's here, sometimes he doesn't. How often have you seen Ms. Heard drink alcohol on the island? Um, she, she drank wine. She drank wine with uh, her her drink was wine with dinner, um, maybe in the afternoon, but I know definitely with dinner. Did you observe Ms. Heard drinking alcohol when Mr. Depp was not drinking alcohol? Objection, leading. No, sustained. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, how often have you seen Mr. Depp drunk? Um, I would know he has a huge tolerance for alcohol. Uh, I haven't seen him passed out drunk um, or anything like that. So I, uh, he drinks, but I haven't seen him passed out drunk. Okay. 
Thank you, Ms. Roberts. Nothing further. All right, cross-examination. Thank you, Your Honor. Ms. Roberts, the salary you receive for managing the Bahama Island is approximately $10,000 a month, correct? Correct. Okay. And so that comes out to $120,000 a year? Correct. Okay. And you've, yes. been, and you've been receiving that salary for many years, correct? Correct. Right. In fact, I think you've got to raise to $10,010 ,010 in 2018. Do you remember that? No, I don't know the exact number, but I know I get that, that a month. Okay. And that's, and that's in addition to all of the expenses, correct? For running the island. The expenses? Of running the island. I get a salary every month? I'm not sure what you're asking me. So the, the other people that are on the island, to the extent they work, they get a different salary, right? Yes. Okay. And all of the expenses you have, you talked about what you have to do to provision the island and everything else and run it. All of those expenses are paid separately, correct? Correct. Okay. Um, and you said you've been managing this island for 15 years for Mr. Depp, is that correct? Approximately, yes. All right. Now, let's talk for a moment about those two videos that you you testified to were part of the house. The first video was missing both the closet and the bathroom, correct? I, I, I don't remember. I'd have to look at it again. All right. And the second... There was a, a bleed, 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 bleed. Sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. I'm sorry. You, you didn't come through. Go ahead. No, I'm sorry. I think in the first video, the beads were the closet, and then there was the bathroom next to the closet. Okay, that was the second. Me, that was the second video. Oh. Do you know who? Sorry. Do you know who took those videos? Oh, I did. Okay. When did you take those videos? Oh, it would have to be. Uh, I'm not sure couple years ago, maybe longer. I'm, was, not, I'm not sure. Okay. Did you take those videos for the UK trial? I, I don't recall if it was for that. Right. Is there a reason that the closet and the bathroom were left out of the first video? No, I, no, I stood in the house and did a circle around of the house. Okay. Who asked you to make that video? I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Was it Mr. Waldman? Adam Waldman? I, I don't, I'm not sure. I don't know. Can't recall? I can't remember who asked. Okay. No, I can't. Okay. Now the second video that shows the closet, and then there's a door there. Would you agree that door opens up into a bathroom? Next to the closet, yes. Okay. And we don't have a video of the, the bathroom, correct? I don't believe there was a video of the bathroom. And, and no one asked you to make a video of the bathroom, correct? Objection relevance. I'll overrule it for now. Correct? Oh, sorry. Um, I'm not sure if anybody asked me to. I, I don't believe I videotaped the bathroom. Okay. And my question was, and no one asked you to videotape the bathroom, correct? Correct. Okay. Now, let's talk for a moment about the logistics of the island. Mm -hmm. So, Mr. Depp's house, we've seen the inside of, and you said that the cafe was... A 30-second walk, I think you said. How, how many yards? Yeah. I don't know. I walk it. It's it's just outside his house through the parking lot and uh, walk way to the cafe. Okay. It, and the, I don't know. Okay. And the cafe is where 
Mr. Depp would regularly have his meals, correct? Correct. All the guests would have their meals there. Okay, including Mr. Depp and Ms. Hurd if she was there and their children, correct? Correct. Okay. And For then, dinners, yes. And then you were located on the other side of the island, correct? That's where you stay? Or I stay in, in the, the middle of the island, yes. Okay. How far away is that from the cafe and the house? Objection compound. Uh, uh, I'll sustain the objection if you want. How far, how far away is it from the house? Where I, I stay? Yes. Um, probably a three-minute golf cart ride. Okay. Five-minute walk. Okay. Uh, and then when other guests come, I think you were talking about tents. Do they stay in tents? No. The tents were, were um, the tents were erected for the, the wedding, and then they were dismantled. And sometimes we would erect them if we were asked to, just in case somebody wanted to stay there. But people didn't stay in the tents. They stayed in the buildings here. Okay. So how, how much accommodation can you handle in the buildings for other guests? Not, I'm not talking about the house, Mr. Depp's house. We've seen that. Um, but how many people can, can actually be accommodated uh, in the buildings? Um, we have a two-bedroom uh, yurt on Brando Beach. We have a, um, a beach house, which has a, a, the bed in it. And then we have a, um, a, what we call a roundhouse, which has a, a bed in it as well. Okay. Now... When Mr. Depp and Ms. Hurd were visiting, whether they had the children there or not, um, typically, would you bring the meals to the cafe for each of the meals? No, sometimes I would take them to the house. It depended on where they wanted to eat. All right, and then typically would you join them for the meal or would you leave the meal and then come back and clean up afterwards? Objection compound. All right, I'll sustain the objection. All right, All right. we'll take that one at a time. Typically, would you bring the meals to them? Myself, myself or one of the, 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 the workers here would, would take the meals. Okay, how, how often was it you that would take them? Um, How often? Maybe every other day. Every day. It depended on on how if people were eating in their buildings or eating together. All right. And would you stay and eat the meal with them, or would you leave? If we were invited for dinner, we would all eat together. Um, usually, we would take the food to the places and leave. Okay. And then, would you be called to come pick them up? No, no. We would sometimes go back in the evenings um, on our own um, and, and clean up and, and turn some of the lights off, and sometimes we would do it in the morning, it depending on what was happening. Okay. So other than bringing the meals, and it could be you or somebody else, uh, how often did you interact with Mr. Depp and Ms. Hurd during the days when they were on the island? On average, every day. In, in what context other than delivering the meals and picking them up? Oh, just see if anything was needed, if everything was all right, um, things like that. Um, generally passing them if they were walking or in the office or, or, or on the beach. Okay. Now, would it be fair to say that you weren't spending 24-7 with them? No, I didn't live with them, no. Okay. And would it be fair to say that you don't know what they were doing during the times that you weren't passing them by or bringing meals? Yes, unless they, they were on the beach. Okay. Then I would know. But. So you wouldn't know what happened, what would be taking place within the house, for example, when you weren't there. Correct? Correct. And you wouldn't know whether Mr. Depp was taking drugs, correct? Correct. And you wouldn't know whether Mr. Depp was drinking, correct? 
I would only know by cleaning up. And you wouldn't know, uh, well, you wouldn't know from cleaning up necessarily whether it was Mr. Depp, Ms. Hurd, or somebody else, would you? Objection you compound. I overruled all about it. Go ahead. Please continue. Un unless um, I would know what it was by what was in the garbage or left out of who consumed or, or what was consumed, I would I would be able to know. Okay. And you wouldn't know what arguments, if there were any, were taking place in that house behind closed doors, right? Correct. And you wouldn't know whether there was any kind of physical abuse that was taking place behind those closed doors, correct? I wouldn't know, correct. Okay. Now, let me just take you for a moment to the December 2015 timeframe. How, how much advance notice are you typically given for when they are, when Mr. Depp and his entourage are going to arrive and for how long they're going to stay. Objection compound. All right, I'll, I'll stay in the objection. All right, let's break it down. How much notice are you given when Mr. Depp and his entourage are coming? It varies. Uh, sometimes it's a couple of days, sometimes it's a couple of weeks. So how much notice were you given in December of 2015 to who would be coming for Christmas on the Bahama Island? I believe um, sometime in November. Okay. For and that trip. I was... All right. And in November, how many people were you told were coming for Christmas on the island? I don't recall how many. I don't recall how many people. It was a lot more than Amber, Johnny, Lily Rose, Jack, and Lily Rose's boyfriend, wasn't it? Yes, it was. In fact, it was Amber's parents, correct? I believe so. And, and it was Rocky Pennington and Josh Drew, correct? I believe they were on the list. And Rocky Pennington's parents. Yes, I believe they were on the list. Do you recall them canceling? Objection, hearsay. I recall. Oh. How is that hearsay? I'll overrule the objection. Go ahead. I recall there was a change um, to the, the guess. When did you learn of that? I don't recall, maybe a couple weeks after, maybe it's the beginning of December, maybe, middle of December. Do I'm you not sure. Do you recall if it was after December 15? I don't recall. D did you think that was a little strange that here these people were going to be at Objection. Christmas on the island and suddenly they cancel? Objection relevance? I think it's highly relevant. I'll sustain the objection. Next question. What, what, if anything, were you told about why they canceled? Objection, hearsay. I, I, party opponent admission. Yep. Well, you do well, lay a foundation know. for that. Okay. Who told you that Amber's parents, her best friend and fiance, and her best friend's parents were, were suddenly canceling coming for Christmas on the island? Objection, compound. I, I'll allow that. Go ahead. I don't know who um, told me, but I did receive a that I, I did receive information that um, they weren't coming, and there were other somebody else was coming instead. And who was that somebody else coming instead? Um, the, it would be Alice, and, and it would be Alice and Greg, and the children and the nanny. Okay. And they were coming later, right? They would be joining. That was, I think was the words. Okay. So, on the December fifth, on the December trip, you testified about a few arguments between Amber and Johnny, right? Do you recall that testimony? 
Yes, I do. Okay. You weren't present when Johnny sustained the gash on his nose, correct? I wasn't there, no. Okay, and you weren't present when the mess was made through the paints that you've described, correct? No. And so you don't know whether there had been a physical altercation and uh, that led to throwing a paint can to try to slow down Johnny, right? No, I just heard yelling in the house. Okay, but that, that yelling in the house wasn't necessarily the same time, was it? You don't know, do you? No, it was all in the same time. Okay, no. Okay. Now, let's talk about the summer of 2013. Are you aware that Paul Bettany claims he's never met Amber? Objection, relevance. What's the relevance? And calls for hearsay. Is she testified that he was there on the island with And calls for hearsay. I, I can ask the question and see if she says. All right, I'll allow the question. Go ahead. Can you repeat it? Are you aware that Paul Bettany has said that he never met Amber Heard? No, I, I'm unaware. I don't, okay. I don't know that. Well, let's stay on the summer of 2013, if we can. Do you have a recollection of Amber and Johnny, Lily Rose and Jack taking one final trip on the yacht that Johnny was going to be selling to J.K. Rowling? I don't know what year that was. I don't know what year that was, but I, I do remember the yacht being sold. So if, I, if I tell you it was July of 2013, does that help refresh your recollection? July 9? Yeah, I, I... All right. Now... July, no, it, it doesn't. I just know the yacht was sold. Okay. And you made arrangements, did you not, for a captain to, to uh, captain the, the yacht and for them to go out on the yacht? No, I didn't have any responsibility for the yacht and, and the crew on the yacht. Okay. Do you have a recollection of being called because Lily Rose and Jack were upset and they wanted to leave the yacht and have a helicopter take them away. Objection, hearsay, and compound. I'm asking whether she has a recollection of this. I'll, I'll allow the question. Can you ask me it again? Do you have a recollection of Lily Rose and Jack being upset on the yacht and wanting to leave it immediately so you arranged for a helicopter to come in to fly them away with Amber? Objection, compound. I'll allow it. Okay, this is it. I, I don't know if Lily Rose and Jack were upset. Um, I do know that um, I did arrange for transportation off the island um, at the time. And in, and, and in fact, Amber went with Lily Rose, correct? It was Amber and her friends and Lily Rose. Okay. And Jack decided at the last minute to stay back, correct? I don't know if he decided last minute. He stayed. Okay. Do you recall Lily Rose telling you that she was upset because her father was drinking and trying to hide it from him? Objection. From her? Hearsay. Uh -huh. I'm, I'm asking whether she has a I'll sustain question. the objection. Okay. Uh, then I'll ask the next one. Do you recall... Mr. Depp passing out in the sand face first. I recall that he was uh, passed out on the beach. He was, he was, yeah, he was out on the beach, yes. Okay, and, and do you recall Jack calling you because he was concerned? Objection hearsay. That's just asking if he called. I haven't asked what he said. No, uh, you, you did. I'll sustain the objection. Okay. Do you have a recollection of Jack being present when Mr. Depp was passed out face first in the sand? Yes. And do you have a recollection of Jack being upset? I, I, I don't have a recollection of him being upset. 
do you have a recollection of him being happy about it? I, I, no, I, I didn't speak with, with Jack um, about it. Okay. But you recall that Mr. Depp was passed out face first in the sand, correct? Objection, Allison answered. I'll sustain the objection. Okay. Next question. All right, thank you. Let's talk about makeup for a moment. So you don't know what type of makeup regimen Amber uses every day, correct? Correct. Okay. And in fact, you don't know, you said at one point you're not sure, but it's a natural look. Do you recall that? Yes, I do. Okay. And would you agree that there are a number of different types of makeup you can use that would still give you a natural look? Objection calls for speculation. Uh, uh, I'll allow it. I, I, I'm guessing there is, yes. Okay. Okay. And, and there's sun in the Bahamas, right? Most of the time. Do you know what Amber wears uh, for sunscreen? Um, I think it was, um, at one point I had a, a brand Shishido or something like that that was on the island that we provided. And do you know whether Amber brought her own as well? I don't know. Do you know whether Amber had a skin condition? I wasn't told. Okay. But you, I take it you didn't ask? No, I, I wouldn't have asked if oh. somebody had a skin condition. Okay. Um, the wedding. The wedding was planned at sunset, correct? Correct. And in fact, it went forward at sunset, correct? It went um, earlier. Than, it, it, was, it was earlier than, in, than, than sunset. So your recollection is that there's no sunset pictures at the wedding? I think so. Okay. It ha there, was, there, was, yeah, there was sunset pictures. Okay, so uh, last couple questions. The, uh, the makeup or not makeup, you were asked whether you observed any injuries on Amber in the December 2015 time frame. Do you believe Amber would cover up bruises to hide them from the kids? Objection calls for speculation. Uh, stay, 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 stay. Do you have any understanding based on your knowledge of Amber, whether she would try to cover up any bruises or cuts. Same objection. To keep them from the kids. I'll sustain the objection. You said that you didn't believe that, she, that Amber was wearing much makeup, but you said she participated in a photo shoot in December 2015. Do you recall that? Yes, I do. Do you know whether Amber was wearing any makeup for a photo shoot? I'm not sure the, the part that I saw, she was in and out of the water. Do you, do you know whether Amber would want to show bruises or cuts in a photo shoot? Objection calls for speculation. I'll sustain the objection. I have no further questions. Okay. Thank you. All right. Redirect. Redirect. Ms. Roberts, how many times have you seen Mr. Depp consume drugs? Objection, leading. All right, sustained. Um, Ms. Bredehoff asked you about um, Mr. Depp passed out on the beach. How would you describe Mr. Depp when you saw him on the beach? Um, he, was, he was passed out. I picked him up and brushed him off, and, and he sat, I left him underneath the... I believe he was in a hammock, and I, he, I believe he had fallen asleep, or he was asleep, and the, and the hammock had overturned. Um, and I picked him up and um, brushed him off, and uh, left him um, on underneath the lanai with Jack. Okay. No further questions. Thank right, you, Miss Roberts. Subject to recall, Miss Roberts. 
Yes. Potentially. Right. So we'll Ms. Roberts, since you're subject to recall, did not discuss your testimony with anybody and just did not watch uh, anything about this uh, case. Okay, ma'am? Okay, thank you very much. All right, thank you. All right, your next witness. Dr. Shannon Curry. She'll come right now. Dr. Who? Shannon Curry. Can you, is it C-U-R-R-Y? C-U-R-R-Y, yes. Okay, thank you. Good morning, Dr. Curry. Good morning. I'm Wayne Dennison. Could you state your full name for the record? Shannon Curry. What do you do for a living? I am a clinical and forensic psychologist. What's your educational background? I received, well, I started college at Georgetown University. I then transferred to the University of California, Irvine, where I received my bachelor's degree in psychology and social behavior. I completed my master's degree in psychology at, the, uh, at Pepperdine University. I went on to complete my doctoral degree in clinical psychology at Pepperdine University, which included several training rotations at different practicum sites. Those are essentially clinical rotations we do to learn various types of psychology. You learn how to do psychological assessment, counseling, et cetera, and you do that in a variety of different settings. And then I completed a year-long doctoral internship at an American Psychological Association accredited uh, doctoral internship. You do this year before you get your degree. And that was at Tripler Army Medical Center. Um, it's traditionally a military internship. They did admit two civilians. I was lucky enough to be one of them. I then completed two years of postdoctoral training at Hawaii State Hospital, a locked forensic psychology facility, and uh, that's where you essentially have individuals with severe mental illness who have committed crimes. Have you done any additional uh, coursework or educational work? I have. So uh, after I completed my doctorate and my postdoctoral training, 
I obtained a, it's called a postdoctoral master of science degree in clinical psychopharmacology. Uh, that is uh, for partial fulfillment of prescription privileges, meaning that it's part of what we need to be able to prescribe medications as a psychologist, because psychologists don't traditionally prescribe, and we can do that with certain military jurisdictions and other states. Um, I also obtained um, advanced training in the Gottman method of couples therapy. Uh, I completed all three levels of training, and then I'm also a Gottman educator for several workshops involving uh, helping parents learn how to prepare to bring their baby home and uh, helping couples without serious problems improve their relationships. Uh, Eric, what's the Gottman method? The Gottman method is a highly research-based uh, method of couples therapy. It's very structured, so uh, different than what many people expect when they think about couples therapy. Uh, I always tell my clients I don't want them to come in just tell each other all their problems and then have an awkward, silent drive home. In this therapy, they come in, they complete a really structured assessment in the beginning. So they complete a bunch of questions. It gives me a ton of information about their relationship before we even get started and really identifies the areas we're gonna target with structured interventions during each session. I think of it almost like a class. Okay. Um, did you get in the course of your education, any specialized training? Any what? Specialized training? I did. So uh, my internship specifically was dedicated to um, essentially working with post-traumatic stress disorder, traumatic stress. Um, a lot of my training has been with psychological assessment and testing. And then my training during practicum and then in my postdoctoral work was dedicated to working with trauma populations and also conducting forensic psychological assessments. Oftentimes, um, forensic psychological assessments actually refers to doing testing and an interview and a couple other things for purposes related to law. So it's the application of psychology to the courts, to, to legal issues. Um, and sometimes that also involves uh, doing assessments for the military to determine whether somebody has sustained a mental disability after combat. Um, you indicated that uh, you did some work at Tripler. Uh, what's Tripler and, and what's the work you did? So Tripler Army Medical Center is a hospital in Honolulu, Hawaii. If anybody's ever gotten to have a vacation in Hawaii, it's a giant pink building there. And um, it's one of the top training sites for military psychologists. I was very, very lucky to be able to train there. They have wonderful funding and a lot of new research going on, particularly for PTSD, but really for all areas of mental health. While I was there, I did rotations in family psychology, so doing family th therapy, I worked with children, but I also did a neuropsychology rotation, learning really the ins and outs of advanced psychological assessment, um, identifying not just mental issues, mental sort of mental illness, but also traumatic brain injuries after trauma, and doing those PTSD evaluations, and then also working with service members who were struggling with a whole host of issues, military stressors, normal life stressors, and then also those who sustained tremendous uh, trauma from combat. Uh, do you still continue to work with the military? I do, actually. Our practice, I, my practice is very focused on military service members, veterans, and their families. Okay. Um, what work have you done uh, in prior uh, litigation matters? Well, uh, most of my litigation, if we're talking about civil work, that has mostly been reports. So this is my first time testifying in a civil matter. Uh, the majority of my forensic work has been in criminal law or providing psychological assessments, and then I produce a really methodical report, um, which is typically reviewed by a judge, um, and a determination is made, or usually there's a settlement uh, beforehand. Uh, do you work uh, in connection with, with any particular courts? I do, so I, I'm actually not sure if I'm on the list anymore in Honolulu, but 
Um, I am a certified forensic evaluator for the state of Hawaii, which means that um, I have been appointed by the court to conduct evaluations for matters that are presented. Uh, and then I'm also on um, the list of forensic evaluators in several courts in Southern California. Um, and then I'm also, I'm contracted by the military, the Department of Defense, uh, now and again for evaluations of PTSD from service members. Okay, you've, you mentioned uh, PTSD a, a couple of times now. Yes. What are you referring to there? So PTSD is a mental illness. Um, it can develop after a person has been exposed to a traumatic event. And our diagnostic statistical manual, the DSM, is sort of the authoritative manual of mental illnesses. It, we, it's considered our Bible of mental illness. We go there for diagnoses. And according to that, there's a specific type of trauma that a person must experience for them to be able to qualify for a diagnosis of PTSD. And that's an event that is life-threatening. It can also involve sexual assault, and you can experience that either directly, but you can also be traumatized if you've seen it happen to somebody else, or if it's happened unexpectedly or violently to somebody close to you, a family member or a friend. Um, and then there's also a provision for people who are first responders if they're encountering really traumatic information regularly, um, that qualifies as a trauma. Now, there are a number of symptoms that can develop. We'll, 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 sure. We'll talk about that some okay. more. Okay. Uh, do you hold any credentials relevant to the work that you do? Well, I am a licensed psychologist. Um, Where? In California and Hawaii. Okay. And any other certifications or other credentials? Not that I can think of off the top of my head other, other than the training with the Gottman Method of Couples Therapy. Have you worked with the Hawaii Department of Courts and Corrections? Yes, I have. In what capacity? Well, I am, I, so that I guess would be a credential. So I am a certified forensic evaluator for the state of Hawaii. In connection with your doctorate, was there a research component? There was. So uh, would you like me to tell you about it? Yes, please. Okay. So I conducted a research study while I was at Pepperdine completing my doctorate. It's called a dissertation. So when you're obtaining your doctorate, you contribute something to the scientific field that you're in. And typically that involves doing what we call novel science. So you're doing an experiment, you're finding out new information and helping the field progress. So I did research in Peru and I was essentially looking at the effectiveness of a therapy intervention there for kids who were growing up in this community called Ayacucho, which was exposed to 20 years of guerrilla warfare, the longest guerrilla war in the history of the world. And uh, there were a lot of issues in that community, tremendous trauma. And my research was around uh, finding interventions that were really effective for that community. Where do you work now? I work for the Curry Psychology Group. Uh, what does the Curry Psychology Group do? We're a multi-specialty mental health center, so we have neuropsychologists who do testing for kids. We have therapists, individual therapists, couples therapists, family therapists. We even have a meditation teacher. We basically try to meet the needs of our community, and we highly specialize in working with military personnel and their families. Yeah. Who's the Curry and Curry Psychology Group? I, I'm Dr. Curry. How many people work for you? As of right now, I believe it's 13. How long have you been doing this kind of work? For about 15 years. How much of your therapy practice focuses on treating individuals? I would say about half of it is individuals, half is couples. Okay. Do you do any training of students? I do. What's that? So uh, we have several unlicensed professionals at our office, and 
um, they're earning their additional hours so that they can get licensed. So they're able to see clients and then I meet with them regularly to supervise them, discuss their cases, provide them with information about different diagnoses, interventions, and treatment methods. How did you get involved in this case? I was contacted by Ms. Camille Vasquez, one of the attorneys for Mr. Depp. Okay. And what was the nature of the contact? Ms. Vasquez called me and indicated um, that she might be interested in having me meet the legal team so that I could discuss my expertise and possibly provide my opinions related to the matter. Okay. What were you asked to provide uh, expert opinion on? So initially, uh, my role that I understood at the time was to review the case materials and um, provide my opinions regarding anything that I noticed that was consistent or even inconsistent with the psychological science um, that exists today on intimate partner violence in Mr. Depp and Ms. Hurd's relationship. But, all right, you used a phrase there, uh, intimate partner violence. What are you talking about? So there are a multitude of different definitions depending on the source or the state. Uh, but essentially, intimate partner violence is abuse. It could be physical, psychological, uh, and it's from one partner to another in an intimate relationship. Okay. Um, did your role in this case evolve over time? Yes, uh, it shifted. So I was retained uh, in, at the end of January 2021, and then uh, had just barely begun to review the documents. The case was postponed, and then in October 2021, um, I was asked uh, by counsel to provide a psychological evaluation of Ms. Hurd. Okay. Did, uh, were you ever asked to do a uh, psycholo psychological evaluation of Mr. Depp? No. Okay. Uh, what types of documents did you consider in this analysis? So I reviewed uh, quite a few documents as part of my evaluation. That included um, all of the case documents, Ms. Hurd's uh, medical records by Dr. Kipper, her prior mental health treatment records. I believe I reviewed records from uh, Dr. Amy Banks, Dr. Bonnie Jacobs, Dr. Cohen, Connell Cohen, um, uh, and also a significant portion of my review involved uh, notes from nurse Erin Filotti at the time, Erin Borum, who spent a significant time with Ms. Hurd in her direct company. I also reviewed exhibits, um, quite a few audio recordings, a video recording, several video recordings or possibly photographs, I might be getting them confused, um, and multiple witness statements, testimony, and um, declarations. Did there come a time when you met directly with Ms. Hurd? Yes, I did. So in conducting my evaluation, I met with Ms. Hurd on two separate dates, December 10th and December 17th, 2021. Uh, approximately how much time have you spent with Ms. Hurd? So the evaluation, uh, we spent 12 hours directly with one another. Um, however, there were, more, there were more hours involved in the evaluation with some breaks. So we spent seven hours together on the first day, December 10th, um, not necessarily together because there was a one hour lunch break and about a half hour with breaks split up through the day. And then on the 17th, we spent a little more than eight hours in the evaluation from start to finish with a one hour break and another half hour of breaks distributed throughout the day. As, the res as a result of the work that you performed, did you form any opinions with respect to Ms. Hurd? I did. What were those opinions? I, uh, the results of Ms. Hurd's evaluation supported two diagnoses, borderline personality disorder and histrionic personality disorder. What is a diagnosis? A diagnosis is a way that we essentially that psychologists, psychiatrists, anybody in the mental health field thinks about a disorder. It helps us to communicate a set of symptoms that a person is experiencing. And along with that set of symptoms, it, it tells other professionals a lot about how those symptoms might have developed, how that person might behave, perceive the world. 
Um, it also drives treatment. The real purpose is to determine what sort of in interventions will be most effective for the person. Yeah. Um, previously, you made reference to, uh, I think you called it the DSM-5. What's yes. that? So the DSM-5, that stands for the Diagnostic Statistical Manual, uh, version 5. And uh, that contains every diagnosis we use in mental health. And uh, we, it's, it's the authoritative manual of mental diagnoses. Is uh, performing diagnoses something you typically do in your line of work? Yes. Thank you. Uh, so you referenced uh, two personality disorders. But what's a personality disorder? To understand a personality disorder, I think it can be helpful first to kind of define personality. So personality, something we take for granted, but these are the traits, the characteristics, the way we think, we feel, and we act that make us who we are. And these traits are pretty stable over time and across situations. We might uh, you know, be sure to mind our P's and Q's when we're meeting somebody new, but overall, if somebody were to describe us or if we were to describe ourselves, we have a pretty good sense of who we are. Um, sometimes an easy way to think of it is imagining how you might describe a brother or sister or a child if you have children. Their personalities are pretty clear to you. A personality disorder is some sort of dysfunction in those enduring traits. So as opposed to other types of mental illness, um, when you think about something like depression, that's episodic. It comes and it goes. And when it's treated with medication, it can pretty much be completely mitigated or minimized in a person's life, and their personality is still there, separate from the depression. When we have a personality disorder, there are going to be disturbances in several different areas that are visible in almost all different facets of their life. Is there a manner in which uh, personality disorders are commonly diagnosed? Yes, so they can be diagnosed in a treating environment. A uh, treating psychologist or a therapist or a psychiatrist simply does a diagnostic interview, which involves assessing multiple areas of a person's history back down through childhood. I'm going to stop you for a second. Yes. What's a treating environment? Oh, sometimes I'll slip into these words. I apologize. So a treating environment in therapy. If somebody is going in for treatment, um, the, psycho the mental health provider will ask them questions to find out what sort of symptoms they've experienced and what sort of things have occurred in their life that might be consistent with these disorders or rule out these disorders, prove that there's no reason for these disorders to be considered. They might also pay attention to their observations of the client over time and new information the client provides them. The most reliable way, however, to ever come about a diagnosis really is through a comprehensive psychological assessment. And I might use the words assessment, examination, testing interchangeably. They all mean the same thing. It's combining information from multiple different sources. Um, one main source is psychological testing using validated objective measures. That means that they've been tested, they've been shown to be accurate for testing what you want to test, and in the environment you're testing. So there are measures specific for court environments where someone might respond differently. You integrate that with the same interview I was telling you that people would do for therapy. We do that as well. And then in a courtroom setting, you're gonna look at all the legal records, all of those documents, corroborating information to sort of check your hypotheses that may be developing and also check against the examinee statements to confirm whether you have enough evidence of a certain diagnosis. So what's a clinical interview? A clinical interview is a very comprehensive interview. It includes a person's entire life history, um, as well as very specifically looks at any symptoms they might have. This can start as far back as birth. You might find out if there were any issues with their delivery, um, any uh, genetic issues, any intellectual issues. How did they do, what was their home life like? How was discipline handled? What's their relationship with their primary caregivers? Were they right, raised by an aunt, an uncle, their parents? How many siblings do they have? How do they get along with their siblings? How many times did they have to move? Were, was there any abuse? Did they have any 
really significant life experiences that come to mind when they think about their childhood. How were they as a student? Did they need special services? Did they get in trouble at school? And you do this, you continue on high school. What were their hobbies? Did they play sports? How many friends did they have? Did they have any trouble keeping those friendships? And you get into adulthood. Did they go to college? Did they not go to college? How come? What sort of jobs have they held? How did those jobs go? How did they end? That's always an important question. What sort of romantic relationships have they been involved in? How do they identify sexually, culturally? Um, let's see, what else? What sort of symptoms have they experienced? Um, you go through the entire gamut of some of the main symptoms. You might screen for depression, um, any disorganized thinking. That means thinking that isn't necessarily in touch with reality. And uh, any current distress they may be ha ha having today. How did you conclude that Ms. Hurd su suffers from the personality disorders that you identified? So uh, there was information that supported it from multiple sources. Um, I conducted testing, including um, one of the main tests that I used. Uh, she obtained scores that were consistent with those diagnoses. And then I also, um, there was evidence of those diagnoses in her records and in her self-report. Okay. All right, Council, why don't we just go ahead and pause for a second while we go ahead and take our morning recess. Okay, mm -hmm. ladies and gentlemen, we'll go ahead and take our 15-minute morning recess. Do not discuss the case and do not do any outside research, okay? Your Honor, when would you like to reconvene? Uh, give me a moment, sir. Doctor, since you're on the stand now, do not discuss your testimony with anybody to include the attorneys at this point. Okay. Understood. All right. Let's go ahead and we'll come back at 11:45. Okay. All right. Thank, thank you. you.
We ready for the jury? Okay. have your seat and your next question sir thank you your honor uh, but dr curry before the break uh, you were talking about some of the uh, factors that you considered in determining uh, that Ms. Hurd suffers from personality disorders and mm -hmm. one of them i think the last one you said before you left was self-report what do you mean by that so uh the self-report would be things that Ms. Hurd indicated to me specifically. Um, so there were a couple of characteristics that she noted in her self-report that were consistent with these personality disorders. Um, the first was actually my own behavioral observations of her based on her self-report. So one of the hallmark characteristics of histrionic borderline, or sorry, histrionic personality disorder is sort of a... It, overly dramatic presentation. We call this impressionistic speech. So it tends to be very flowery. It uses a lot of descriptive words like magical, wonderful, and it can go on for quite some time and yet it really lacks any substance. So at the end, you're left wondering what was just said or what the answer is to the actual question. So that occurred a number of times. Um, and it also represented the kind of the quick shifts you'll see between emotions. So she would suddenly be one way and then she would become very animated or very um, uh, sad. And when people are displaying these emotions with this personality disorder, it, there's a sense of shallowness to it. People who are observing them will feel like uh, it's almost play acting, and they might not be able to put their finger on it, but part of it is because of the rapidness with which the person can switch emotions and also the lack of substance. They don't really refer to, I feel this way. They might describe emotions, they might describe events, but very rarely, and I Ms. Heard did not say, I feel vulnerable. She never really indicated a vulnerable feeling of her own. Then the substance of her self-report. So when I was asking her information about her history. We're, we're going to uh, ask more about that later. I'm just trying to get a sense of what a self-report was. Oh, okay. Um, what psychological tests did you perform? Okay, so psychological tests, I, uh, I'll just go in order. So first of all, I asked her a couple questions from something called the mini mental status exam. That's really just a fancy way of saying that I wanted to make sure that she was alert and oriented to, we call it person, place, and time. That means she knew who she was, she knew who I was, she knew where we were, and she knew the date. That, make, that way I can ensure that she's able to participate in the evaluation and understand what's happening. I then um, administered something called the Minnesota Multiphasic Personality Inventory Two. The two means that it's the second edition. And this is something we call an objective measure. So um, it uh, asks 567 questions or statements and the person either agrees or disagrees with them, how much the statement represents them. And this test has been around since 1943. There are more than 10,000 studies showing that it is appropriate for determining somebody's personality traits it measures all of those things I sort of mentioned, how a person thinks, feels, and behaves in multiple different aspects of their lives. It also measures very accurately um, any signs of mental illness or dysfunction. 
And the reason I also really like this test, whenever you're using a test for an evaluation that's gonna be used in a forensic setting, people have a lot of incentive to present themselves in a way that's gonna benefit their case. And they may want to look like they're sicker than they really are. They may want to look much healthier than they really are. And some of those um, incentives, they may not even realize that they're intending to do that. So it can be conscience, conscious or unconscious, but you really need to have a test that can check for that. And the MMPI-2 has a set of validity scales, we call them. These are scales that measure really the truthfulness and accuracy with which a person is approaching the test. And these, te these scales on this particular test have been so well researched over many decades that they've become very nuanced and they can tell us a lot about if somebody's, for instance, exaggerating, are they elevating one of the scales that shows that they're exaggerating on purpose? Are they exaggerating in a manner that's more like a cry for help? Are they exaggerating in a manner that's clever and sophisticated or more obvious? And then the same exact thing goes for trying to minimize symptoms. We have a number of scales that can show us all the different, if somebody's trying to say they're the most wonderful person on earth, or if they're just trying to deny problems, and if they're doing that again in a very clever way or more of an obvious way. So that test was my choice for this case. There's one other reason I'd like to add, is that part of my evaluation was, uh, one of the reasons was to assess whether Ms. Hurd has post-traumatic stress disorder, which I told you about earlier, um, as a result of the incidents that she's alleged occurred by Mr. Depp. And that's a really tough disorder to find out if somebody's faking it or not. It's one of the most easily faked disorders. Most of us know what it feels like to feel anxious. And a lot of people have seen war movies and movies that depict somebody having PTSD. In fact, some research has shown that if you give someone a diagnostic checklist and said, show that you have PTSD, they can do it 96% of the time, just someone on the street. So you really need a test that's very sensitive to that. And the MMPI-2 has been shown in multiple studies to be excellent at detecting those attempts. Okay, you keep using MMPI-2, that's the abbreviation that you folks use for? The, I'm sorry if I hadn't said that. That's the Minnesota Multiphasic Personality Inventory. Uh, what other uh, psychological testing did you perform? So I also performed the Clinician Administered PTSD Scale, Dash 5, and that Dash 5 links it to the diagnosis for PTSD in our current diagnostic manual, the fifth version. Um, to do that test, you first administer something called the Life Events Checklist. And the Life Events Checklist, both of these tests, by the way, were developed by the National Center for PTSD with the Department of Veterans Affairs. But the Life Events Checklist lists 16 different very stressful life events that people can go through that are often, can be associated with developing PTSD. And then it also has a 17th item that you can fill in if you feel like you've been through something really difficult that wasn't included. Now, I like to also add something called the Life Events Checklist 5 interview, which digs a little bit deeper into the person's childhood as well to find out if they, what sort of, there's so many different things that can be difficult growing up. And also, it's very important that you have the person determine which of the events they've listed, let's say they have a number of different types of traumas, which one do they feel like was the most traumatic for them? Which one still causes them to feel distressed when they talk about it? And sometimes they can't just identify one. And then that, has a, that leads to your next decision. So if they have multiple different similar types of events, like seeing combat, then you might use that as the worst one, the multiple similar. So that looks like uh, you describe an anchor, we call it, to do the testing, and we would maybe describe the anchor as the worst of my combat experience, okay? Now, if somebody had multiple different traumas from different times in their life, like childhood abuse, and then went to combat and had some horrible things happen there, you would do the clinician-administered PTSD scale test, the one that comes after, you do one for the childhood event and a separate one for the adulthood event.
does this clinician administered PTSD scale have a handy abbreviation? It does. <laughs> okay. We'll call it the CAPS-5. That, that's actually what it goes by. Okay. Um, how common is the use of the MPPI, MMPI-2 in your profession? The MMPI-2 is actually the most commonly used assessment worldwide by mental health professionals and in forensic settings for the court. Why do you use it? I used it for that purpose and for its excellent validity in those settings across genders, across ethnicities, um, for different reasons. And um, when I keep saying validity, by the way, what I mean is accuracy, or, uh, and I'll try to work that in. But then also for detecting the accuracy with which a person reports PTSD. Okay. Um, is that scaled in some way? I'm sorry, what was that? Do, does that make use of a scale in some way? The MMPI-2, do you mean specifically for PTSD? Yes. There's actually a combination of scales you want to look for. You would never make the diagnosis just based on one scale alone, or even on the test alone. You'd integrate other data. Yeah. How did you administer the MMPI-2 to Ms. Hurd? I provided her the test on an iPad. She essentially had her own little desk area and then an iPad. She hit start, it provides her with the instructions, and then the it gives her 567 statements in order. For each one, she taps true or false. What did you learn about Ms. Hurd from the results of the MMPI-2? Quite a bit. I, um, I wrote up a 25-page interpretation outline. Um, it has numerous, numerous scales. So one of the reasons I like this measure so much is that it can tell you so much about multiple different traits and tendencies and mental issues. Um, one of the primary things I learned was that um, she had a very uh, sophisticated way of minimizing any personal problems. Um, I also learned that she tends to, uh, well, there were a number of characteristics that were consistent with the eventual diagnoses, but um, some of the primary characteristics, and I'm gonna to try to condense 25 pages here, were essentially um, externalization of blame, uh, tending to have a lot of inner hostility that is attempted to be controlled, um, a tendency to be very self-righteous, but to also deny that self-righteousness and to judge others um, critically uh, against these sort of high standards for moral value, but also to deny doing that. Essentially to, to claim that one is uh, uh, very non-judgmental and accepting and yet very full of rage, really. And, um, and these aren't facts, but it, her scores essentially correlated. So they were consistent with other people who obtain these scores who have been shown through many, many, many studies to have these very specific traits. So externalization of blame, um, a lot of inner anger and hostility. Sometimes that anger among these groups with similar scores, these people might have that anger kind of explode out at times. They tend to be very passive aggressive. They may be self-indulgent, very self-centered. Um, they uh, could use manipulation tactics to try to get their needs met, very needy of attention, acceptance, approval. Um, they tend to uh, distance people who are close to them. Initially, they may seem very charming. They're very socially sophisticated, actually. That was a major component on there. Um, they have a capacity to kind of offer some of their faults, but uh, in a way, but only the ones that people think of lightly and can all relate to. And so they can present as very fair and balanced, but in actuality, they really might uh, uh, be very judgmental of others and unaware of problems in their behavior and their thinking. So after you uh, provide the, the examination via the, via the iPad, what do you do? So once they've completed the test, you can have it scored by the computer immediately. Um, it's a very, very complex test to interpret, but right away you get a list of what's called critical items. And these are just some, uh, a couple of the items, the statements that are presented that are 
more um, clearly symptom-based, and I always follow up with the examinee. Some of these might have to do with suicide. Some of them might have to do with other symptoms that you just like to get a little bit more information on because sometimes an examinee might tell you they're completely fine when you're doing your interview with them and that they have no symptoms. And then when they take the test, it says that they're having trouble sleeping or they struggle with nausea all the time or they feel very anxious. And so you wanna follow up on that. Okay. Uh, what's a code type? A code type, let me uh, think of how to explain this very, very simply. So the main scales, and I keep referring to scales, these are just uh, the main scores that come up on this test. We um, can refer to them as codes. And when I was saying that Ms. Hurd's scores could be compared to certain groups of people that had been researched before to obtain similar scores, the research has shown that certain people will have certain scores that kind of spike on this, okay? And so all of those traits that I were descri was describing, those are traits that are found in these code types. So it means that number two, score number two was high and score number six was high. And so if we have those two scores were both high, then that's a two six code type. And what these code, code types- type, What code type was misheard? Ms. Hurd had the clearest code type was 3-6, but then she also had some other code types that were less significant. What characteristics are associated with a 3-6 code type? So a 3-6 code type, a lot of that anger is expressed in this code type. Um, there can be actually a lot of cruelty, uh, usually with people who are less powerful, uh, Actually, when you see this code type, you want to, if you can, to follow up with subordinates, coworkers, people who may have observed their behavior more closely. The three six code type is very concerned with their image, um, very attention seeking, uh, very prone to externalizing blame to a point where uh, it's unclear whether they can even admit to themselves that they do have responsibility in certain areas. A uh, lot of suppressed and denied anger, but the anger is very present, will explode out, and a lot of issues in their close relationships. How does Ms. Hurd's code type uh, fit in with your overall opinion as to personality disorders? Well, um, this might be an appropriate time to describe a little bit about these personality disorders because I think what you'll hear is that there's a lot of consistency there. Uh, so borderline personality disorder is a disorder of stability. It's instability, and it's instability in personal relationships. It's instability in their emotions. It's instability in their behavior, and it's instability in their sense of self and their identity. And that instability is really driven by this underlying terror of abandonment. So one of the key features also of this disorder, and you, you, all of it is like pistons of an engine kind of firing off and igniting one another. But when somebody is afraid of being abandoned by their partner or by anybody else in their environment and they have this disorder, they'll make desperate attempts to prevent that from happening. And those desperate attempts could be physical aggression, it could be threatening, it could be harming themselves. But these are behaviors that are usually very extreme and very concerning to the people around them. Um, uh, the anger is typically what, sadly, it's counteractive, right? So the thing these people fear most is being abandoned, but over time, the anger, the explosive anger that they show when somebody is uh, needing space or when somebody's really not doing anything wrong because a lot of times they read into things that they perceive as being a slight to them or being somebody intending to harm them that actually isn't happening. They'll exaggerate it um, and they'll explode. They'll react in this heightened manner that is just exhausting for their partners. Oftentimes their partners will uh, try to make them happy at first and really allow themselves to be a punching bag, thinking that they can somehow solve this problem, that somehow they can make this better. And eventually it just overwhelms them. 
the histrionic personality disorder is well, very before similar. Before we move on to that, okay. um, are you familiar with the term emotional reactivity? I am. What is that? So emotional reactivity is very common in the diagnosis. So essentially, uh, like I said, there's instability in emotions. People with borderline personality disorder are often misdiagnosed as having bipolar disorder because they can be up and down. They can look very depressed and they can look very elated, but these changes are happening within a matter of hours. Somebody with bipolar disorder, these are, this is a clinical depression lasting days, weeks, a clinical mania where sometimes they even need to be hospitalized because they're so grandiose. They clear out their bank account and go to Vegas and spend it all. They're acting in some very bizarre ways. With uh, borderline personality disorder, you're having these fluctuating moods constantly. And again, this hypersensitivity to being slighted or feeling offended, really driven by the fear that if you're offended or slighted, if the therapist comes in two minutes late, or if somebody shows up to dinner two minutes late, that they might be abandoning you. And it's not as if the borderline is considering themselves abandoned in that moment, but they just know that they have this overwhelming emotion and there are no attempts to control that emotion. There's no, there are no attempts to regulate it. So if they're in the middle of the restaurant and they feel offended, they're gonna start the fight. Uh, people are going to see it or they might just start crying or break down but they'll make a lot of accusations and that reactivity is when you're gonna just, you're gonna see a lot of this escalation in the bizarre behavior. They can react violently, they can react aggressively, they will often physically prevent their partner from trying to leave if their partner wants to get space from all of this intense emotion. And oftentimes they will uh, be abusive to their partners in these situations. Sometimes they'll physically restrain them from leaving and become injured that way. But also, people with borderline personality disorder, it seems to be a predictive factor for women who implement violence against their partner. And one of the most common tactics that they'll use is actually physically assaulting and then getting harmed themselves. But mostly, um, we call this administrative violence. So essentially, this is saying that they'll make threats using the legal system. So. Um, they might say that they are going to file a restraining order or claim abuse, or they might do these things to essentially try to keep their partner from leaving. In the moment, again, they're not consciously thinking, I'm gonna keep my partner from leaving right now. They're just thinking, I can't stand this. I hate my partner. They went from idealizing to suddenly devaluing because of the hurt, and they'll do anything to express that big emotion of anger. Your Honor, may we approach all right, yes, sir. Okay, um, you indicated, uh, you were talking about emotional reactivity. Uh, what, if any, emotional reactivity did you uh, observe in your review? And let's do this one at a time. Okay, so there were uh, a couple indications to me. Uh, first, uh, I can sort of think about it with the treatment records. So particularly uh, Dr. Um, Cohen Connell's. Am I getting the name right? I feel like for some reason in my mind, I might have just reversed it. Uh, but Dr. Cohen's records, <laughs> I did reverse it. 
uh, he actually refers to this reactivity quite a bit and to Ms. Hurd's temper. And that, that temper, it's often branded, or being hot-headed, is really characteristic of borderline personality disorder. Um, as is their tr very charming, personable nature. It's, it's, this is a disorder of contradictions. Uh, in Nurse Filotti's notes, um, she had, I thought there was something interesting. She references a night when they're out to dinner, I believe in London, and she provided positive reinforcement to Ms. Hurd because Ms. Hurd had been uh, disappointed by a mistake made by the server, and it sort of references how previously she might have criticized the server or be, become upset by that, um, and that she didn't this time, and so that that had been some a sort of a, a step forward. Uh, and uh, there was also an indication actually in Dr. Hughes's, uh, Dr. Hughes is a forensic psychologist who had been appointed by Ms. Hurd to conduct as an evaluation as well. In Ms. Hughes's interview of Ms. Hurd, Ms. Hurd disclosed that she had cut her arm in the past, which is a typical reactive type thing somebody with this diagnosis can do. It's one of the symptoms. Um, and that's sort of all I can think of top of my mind from the treatment records. Moving into um, some of the declarations um, or deposition testimony, what struck me was Ms. Raquel Pennington's testimony. Um, she's a former friend of Ms. Hurd's and she indicated, she told a story about, I suppose they were shopping for Thanksgiving accoutrements, something to prepare for Thanksgiving, and Ms. Hurd struck her in the face sort of out of the blue, um, which is, I, I thought was interesting because that is one of those signs of borderline personality disorder where if a, if a friend or a loved one isn't meeting your needs in that moment, um, borderline, people with borderline personality disorder can be very caring in their relationships. As long as their needs are being met, they feel that their needs should be met when they want them met um, at a specific level, and if they're not, then that anger, that sense of harm causes them to react. So the striking Ms. Pennington per Ms. Pennington's report in the declaration, or the testimony I thought was pretty consistent. And then uh, Ms. Hurd's own self-descriptions. Uh, okay, we're okay. gonna, um, I'm gonna ask you a question about, sure. um, you indicated Ms. Pennington uh, was a former friend of, yes. of Ms. Hurd. Is there uh, a relationship between borderline personality disorder and uh, intimate relationships? Yes, so, uh, so the instability definitely translates to their relationships. You'll see relationships start very intensely. People will, uh, somebody with borderline personality disorder perceives the relationship as extremely close. This pattern of idealizing and devaluing is definitely at play. They do this with their lovers and also with their friends. And so this might be the perfect person, their perfect soulmate friend, perfect soulmate partner, and their engagement in the relationship is very alluring, very charming to the other person. Um, and so initially everything seems great. But what occurs is that reality sets in. People are not perfect, even when we have a lot of in common with them. Um, whereas most of us can accept somebody as a whole, somebody who has a little bit of flaws and still think this is my great friend who always all constantly running late for dinner. The person with borderline personality disorder, things are in these extremes, this black and white, we call it splitting. And so that person goes from being idealized, the perfect person, to dumpster. They are totally devalued. They are the worst friend. They don't care anything about me. I have better people around. And then there will be a repair because the person with this disorder does feel remorseful after they have these reactions, angry, tell their friend off. But over time, it wears away at these relationships. And so what you'll usually see is many, many transitions in their friendships over the years. People who have sort of fallen by the wayside, who were really very close knit at one time and then, but there's not a lot of consistency in the long term. You'll also see that with their intimate relationships, many, many relationships, but none that are particularly long term. Uh, how does borderline personality disorder relate to identity issues? 
So again, that instability also travels toward identity. And when I was describing personality earlier, I was talking a little bit about those traits we have that help us know who we are. When you have borderline personality disorder, that actually is not something you understand. So uh, people with this disorder actually take on the identity of the people they're spending time with because it's comforting. It's very uncomfortable to not know who you are. Some people with this disorder will describe a feeling of emptiness when they feel like they've been abandoned because now they don't know who they are in the world. And so when somebody with this disorder is going through that initial enmeshment phase with new people and they're idealizing them, they often will take on the identities of those people. So they may mimic them in a lot of ways. They might mimic the way they dress, their interests, the way they talk. Um, and for this reason, the people around somebody with this disorder kind of from the outside may feel like, wait, I thought you were this way and now you're advocating for this and this is your new main interest in life or the thing you're throwing yourself into all completely. Music tastes might change, hobbies will change, the way they dress. Okay. Um, in addition to borderline personality disorder, I understand that you uh, diagnosed a, another personality disorder. What's that? So histrionic personality disorder and these are really two sides of the same coin. Um, they belong to the same cluster. We call these clusters. It's a way to organize personality disorders in that DSM. And this cluster is described as the personality disorders that are dramatic, erratic, and emotional. Okay, so unpredictable, but really having to do with emotions and relationships. They're very similar. Whereas I was saying that borderline personality disorder, a lot of the key features that you're gonna notice are instability. When it comes to histrionic, a lot of the key features are going to be drama and shallowness. Similarly, with borderline personality disorder, there's this, under, uh, this underlying drive of avoiding abandonment. With histrionic personality disorder, that underlying drive is to always be the center of attention because if you don't have that attention on you, it feels similarly to borderline personality disorder. You feel pretty empty. Like you don't have that sense of being or of value, okay? So whereas borderline personality disorder might have more of the visible reactivity if somebody seems to be leaving, with histrionic personality disorder, what you're going to see is extreme discomfort with not being the center of attention extreme efforts to be the center of attention. And when they feel that they're not the center of attention, you will see some strange things, making up stories to try to get attention, often taking on a victim or princess role. Those two roles in particular are pretty consistent. Seeking caretaking. Borderline personality disorder is similar because with borderline personality disorder, these shifts of identity and the splitting, you might see somebody go from being, in the DSM it describes it as a needy supplicant of help, seeking the perfect caretaker, to suddenly being the avenger against injustice or thinking that their partner is a terrible person. With histrionic, what you'll see is somebody who um, wants to be the center of attention, has sort of that impressionistic speech, very flowerly, uh, very enthusiastic, but nothing's really being said. The moment your attention wears away because they're so demanding for attention, that's when they might take the victim role or the princess role and even make up stories. Sometimes those stories are to bolster the victim role. Sometimes those stories are just to make them look more interesting or accomplished in their mind so that they can get respect and attention that way. Is there a relation between histrionic personality disorder and attractiveness? attractiveness. <laughs> there is, strangely, and this is always one of the trickiest things to talk about because uh, how do you, I mean, how is that a symptom? But characteristically, people with this disorder are very, very interested in looks, um, but more importantly, they utilize their looks to get that attention, to get that respect that they're seeking. And so this type of a personality might be flirtatious with everybody. Um, characteristically, they actually couldn't, 
even be subtly, and when I say flirtatious, I'm not talking overtly sexy, but uh, kind of inappropriately flattering. Sometimes they act in a kind of a girlish way to be cute and to a gender attention. And this will even occur in their therapy relationships as a way to sort of avoid getting negative feedback or criticism. Oftentimes they'll bring the therapist gifts or be distracting um, if they engage in therapy uh, because they just don't want any criticism. They want the therapist to like them. Does the intelligence of the affected person bear on the manner in which these disorders present? Excuse me, I choked a little bit of water. Uh, it, yes, and I think one way to think about it that's probably a little more accurate than just intelligence is in psychology we would describe this more as sophistication, so street smart, so to speak. Um, the way, for instance, I've had many clients who have borderline personality disorder who are um, messy and really clearly suffering, and um, they might be difficult and all over the place and yell at you in the middle of a session, but it's so, uh, uh, it's not tailored. It's so much easier to work with because of that just openness and rawness of it, genuineness. Sometimes you'll have a more sophisticated presentation. There are nine symptoms and only five have to be met. So there are a lot of different combinations and different ways it, it can present. And sometimes, you'll have more of a petulant version of this where it really shows when you push the button and you're kind of, whoa, what was that? So somebody who's really productive, high functioning, successful, and you get to know them and you think they're fantastic because they're so interested in you too. And you might not realize it, but they're mimicking you perfectly. So you're really just kind of falling in love with this new friend who is being you. Um, but then all of a sudden, uh, you know, you say something that they think is offensive and you can't, in, even in your wildest thoughts, understand how that could have offended somebody, but their reaction is so strong that you kind of buy into it. Gosh, maybe I did say something offensive and, and you feel bad about it. So that sophisticated version, they can be a little bit more calculated in the way they present. They tend to kind of hit you where it hurts a little bit more and they can be actually very, very destructive. What conclusions were you able to draw about Ms. Hurd's sophistication from her testing? Well, from her testing and from her presentation, she's, she was very likable, but her testing in particular um, showed that she approached it in a manner that, uh, remember I told you about those, those scales that are pretty neat. Um, she approached it in a manner that very clearly minimized any psychological dysfunction, um, not just that, but really presented herself as free of any problems. And she did so in a way that was very, um, very sophisticated, not obvious, um, by responding to questions that most people might not notice would, were trying to detect that. Uh, how did you determine that? So that's based on a particular scale on the MMPI-2 that is designed specifically to detect a type of responding that's a little bit more clever, a little bit more sophisticated, minimizing problems in a way that most lay people probably wouldn't understand, and even providers, very difficult to detect. You mentioned that one of the characteristics of borderline personality disorder is emotional reactivity. How might that present in an intimate relationship? So I think it probably presents mostly, uh, or you'd see the bulk of it in intimate relationships because of that regular interaction and the desire for your partner to meet all of your needs, to be the perfect caretaker. Also that, um, the hallmark of the disorder with the splitting. So idealizing, devaluing, and the perceiving of all sorts of neutral events as somehow demeaning or disrespectful. Um, it's regular escalations of anger, frustrated complaints, criticisms of your partner. But 
because the person with borderline personality disorder, first of all, they're more sensitive to things. They feel distress more strongly, and then that distress lasts longer. So these types of blow-ups go on forever, and they're very cyclic. It feels like you just can't get a resolution, and eventually the partner will try to leave, will want to leave to take a break. It wears them down, and that's when the borderline might explode and act very aggressively or violently to try to prevent them from leaving. In addition to uh, diagnosing Ms. Hurd with uh, these two personality disorders, uh, did you form an, uh, another opinion about Ms. Hurd's mental status? Yes, so uh, not, there, uh, go ahead. If the answer to that is yes, I'm going to now ask you okay, what Okay, yes, that? I did. Okay, what is it? So uh, in addition to looking for Ms. Hurd's general mental status, any psychological issues that were present, I very specifically um, was assessing to determine whether post-traumatic stress disorder was present, and it was not. How do you know that? So first of all, from, uh, well, from multiple information sources, right? So I was integrating the interview, my review of the data, the case records, other people's testimony, her treatment records, and then I also conducted, in addition to the MMPI-2 and looking at that data, I also conducted uh, the clinician administered PTSD scale, the CAPS-5, which is the gold standard PTSD assessment um, developed by the National Center for PTSD, shown to be valid, accurate for use, not just with service members, but also with civilians, men, women, all genders, um, and also all ethnicities, and then also specifically for use in a courtroom setting. How do you conduct the CAPS-5? So the CAPS-5 is a standard interview. What that means is that it's an interview with very clear questions that are scripted, and you ask those same questions every time you test a person. So because you're doing that, you're actually taking something that would typically be kind of subjective, an interview with somebody, and you're making it more objective. When you ask those same questions in the same way, every time somebody's assessed with this, now you can apply a scoring protocol and actually score their responses. Okay. As a result of applying those protocols, what did you conclude? Ms. Hurd did not have PTSD, and there were also pretty significant indications that she was grossly exaggerating symptoms of PTSD when asked about them. How did you make that latter conclusion? So one of the strengths of this test, as I mentioned, the important thing about any test used when you're doing an evaluation in forensics is to make sure that the person is responding accurately. And this test does that by not just asking people whether they have a symptom, but asking follow-up questions that draw out very detailed accounts of every single symptom of PTSD. And when you're really familiar with this disorder, which you need to be to administer this test, there are nuances in the way a person will describe their symptoms that have been shown repeatedly to indicate exaggeration or faking. There are also indications when somebody is clearly giving you a genuine response. Okay. What, if any, symptoms of PTSD did you observe in this herd? So um, there are 20 kind of core symptoms that somebody might can manifest with PTSD. You don't have to have all of them. Um, Ms. Hurd initially said that she had, in the first question, you say, do you ever have this, before you get to the more nuanced follow-up questions. When I asked that first question on each item, she initially said, yes, I have that, to 19 of the 20 symptoms. That's not typical even of somebody with the most disabling form of PTSD. When we eventually sort of dialed it down, she had three remaining symptoms. And having symptoms of any disorder is common for all of us. Some of us struggle with sleep. Some of us get anxious. Um, it could be several different disorders. It could just be that you have this struggle in your life. But she had three specific symptoms that I scored as present. 
Um, off the top of my head, I might miss one, but one was sleep disturbance. So um, she reported that she has frequent nightmares. Um, another one was that she said that she tends to have a startle response. So if she gets startled or surprised, um, she tends to stay in sort of a hyper startle mode for quite a while. And that's consistent with a couple of things. It can be consistent with PTSD if other criteria are met. It's also consistent with childhood complex trauma, which is something that can occur when your brain is forming. If you constantly feel unsafe, if your parents are abusive, um, or if they're not present, if you're neglected, you can develop certain physiological responses that can stay for a long time in your life. So I, I noted that that was, seemed like a, a very genuine, accurate account where she stays in the state of kind of hyper arousal, has a hard time calming down if she gets surprised. You, um, mentioned, you mentioned nightmares as well. Yes. Did she recount for you the nature of the nightmares? So they were vague. Uh, she indicated that uh, she has recurrent nightmares and that she feels as though she's being held down. Um, in there, there was some conflict in that account because even though that could be a PTSD symptom, it is, it is fairly vague, but I still scored it as present. And in her initial treatment with Ms., or with, I'm sorry, with Dr. Bonnie Jacobs, uh, which I believe started before she began dating Mr. Depp, she had indicated to Dr. Jacobs, according to Dr. Jacobs' notes, that she was having repetitive nightmares back then and that they were related to her childhood trauma. Um, and so that came up several times in the notes. Dr. Jacobs kept mentioning that. Thank you. What is feigning? Feigning is essentially faking or exaggerating uh, symptoms that aren't present. Does the CAPS-5 control for that? It doesn't necessarily control for it. It can expose it and by drawing out that, the... How does that work? Because you're not just simply handing the person a checklist that says, here are all the symptoms of PTSD. Why don't just check off the ones you have, which clearly if you're trying to look like you have PTSD, you would just check them all. The CAPS-5, because it requires them to describe in detail how they experience the symptom, where it shows up, what it looks like, what sort of examples they can give you, how many times it's happened in the last couple of weeks, how many times it's happened in the last month. By the end of each symptom, you've gotten a very good picture of a couple of things. One, does it meet the definition of the symptom? Are they getting it right, right? Is this actually the symptom or are they kind of confusing this with something else? Number two, are they giving you very vague accounts um, are they giving you kind of a stereotyped idea of what the symptom is based on media or movies or something that actually is completely different from genuine experiences of this symptom? Or are they giving you a very genuine heartfelt, sometimes minimizing, but it's, it's ticking all the boxes, their mannerisms while they're describing it, the uh, actual very specific, very nuanced, symbolic ways they're describing it. A lot of times um, it smells, it sounds, that all appears in genuine accounts and it's something that people really get wrong when they're feigning. Um, in addition to the, your conclusion that uh, Ms. Hurd does not have PTSD, did you make a conclusion with respect to her symptoms? Uh, yes, actually I did. So. Uh, you know, just because somebody doesn't have PTSD doesn't mean that they weren't harmed psychologically by whatever is being alleged. In this case, Ms. Hurd is alleging that she was psychologically harmed and that she suffered PTSD because of abuse that she alleges occurred by Mr. Depp. So I also, the MMPI too is helpful because it shows you kind of everything, any other symptoms. And then in Ms. Hurd's own self-report and her prior treatment records, I knew that she had uh, reported to me that uh, she had had some other symptoms. So now what becomes really important is determining, and let me clarify one thing here, not so much a diagnosis, but did she start to experience symptoms during the relationship and after? Did they worsen after? 
Or could these types of symptoms or reports be explained by other factors? A, by feigning, B, by pre-existing conditions, or C, by other stressful life events that might have occurred. So the main symptoms that I was looking at didn't meet criteria for PTSD, right? There was also um, you know, substantial evidence of this sort of emotional dysregulation, emotional disorganization, the shallowness, the dramatic affect. Now, when you have a lot of childhood trauma, you can actually have some similar type presentation in adulthood. There are some differences though, but also that's not something that would have occurred after this relationship. So now I was looking at, are there indications that these types of things that she's described, this transient anxiety, the issues with sleep, were these there prior? And sure enough, um, Ms. Hurd, in her own self-report stated to me that when she first got to LA, she was seeking treatment for, in her words, blanket anxiety and depression. Um, she also reported that she was taking medications. In general, none of them were helpful. That's actually very typical of borderline personality disorder. Medications typically aren't very helpful for somebody with a disorder. They really need an intensive, lifelong type of therapy, which is not necessarily as relevant to this. Um, but interestingly also, people with borderline personality disorder often respond really positively to um, stimulant medications that are uh, given for ADD or ADHD. And in one of Nurse Filati's notes, she reported that Ms. Hurd told her that none of the medications were working for her except for one provisional, which is often prescribed as a stimulant medication. And I just thought that was interesting and sort of consistent with more of these lifelong personality disorders that aren't necessarily caused by a harm by any allegations, but have been there and will remain there typically. The other uh, issue, you know, so the anxiety, she had already indicated that it, that had been there prior, but the form of the anxiety. So looking at Dr. Hughes's testing and then also looking at the scores on the MMPI, when you look at all these little combinations of the scores, you can actually learn a lot about, is the anxiety related to an event or is this more a person who tends to be an anxious person regardless of what's going on in their life. And somebody might describe them as a worry wart. And the scores, the little combination of scores that she obtained actually indicated that it was the latter, that her anxiety tends to be separate from events and more just kind of a constant and it comes and goes, but it, it's more of a trait. I have no further questions for this witness. All right. Maybe we, why don't we go ahead and, uh, Ms. Brigham, go ahead and have our lunch break. It might be a good idea to, to break it up there. Okay, I know. I can see you jumping up. All right. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, let's go ahead and take our lunch recess. Just again, do not do any outside research and don't discuss the case with anybody, okay? And we'll have you back here. And again, Dr. Curry, since you're in the middle of your testimony, please do not discuss your testimony with anybody at this time, okay? All right, let's just, while we come back at 150, okay? Come back at 150? All right, thank you.
your seats. All right, cross-examination, you can sit down now. Thank you, Your Honor. <clears throat> Dr. Curry, you're not board certified, correct? No, I'm not. Not in clinical psychology or in forensic psychology, correct? No, I'm a licensed clinical psychologist. But you're not board certified? No. Okay. And you also have only been practicing approximately eight years, is that correct? That's not correct. How many years? I've been licensed for 10 years, okay. and I've been practicing for about 15 years. Okay. And that includes what you went through with your different trials in Hawaii and everything else that you testified to, correct? Yes. Okay. Now, you went to Mr. Depp's home for dinner and drinks before you were hired as an expert in this case, correct? That's not quite right. I was interviewed at Mr. Depp's home by his legal team. Dinner was served. You, in attendance with Mr. Depp was Adam Waldman, correct? Yes. Ben Chu, correct? Yes. Camille Vasquez? Yes. Okay. And the dinner lasted approximately three to four hours, correct? Yes. And it included the interview. drinks, correct? Yes, dinner and I believe drinks were served. Okay. And this was before you were hired as an expert, correct? Yes, this was an interview so that they could make an informed decision as to whether or not to retain me. And don't you think that's a little odd that you're getting interviewed by Mr. Depp to decide whether you're going to testify adversely against Amber Heard? I was interviewed by the legal team. Okay. And Mr. Depp was present. It was his home, correct? Yes. And he was serving dinner and drinks. He correct? was not serving dinner and well, drinks. Well, it was at his house at his behest, correct? Yes, it was at his house. Okay. And you were contacted by Camille Vasquez, somebody you knew in the community in February of 2020. Is that correct? I knew of Ms. Vasquez professionally. We live in the same city and I work with many attorneys. And at that time, you not only knew Johnny Depp, you'd seen a number of his TV and movie roles, and you believed he was a good actor, correct? Not correct. I did not know Johnny Depp. Well, I had you seen knew several of, of his movies. You knew who he was? Yes. Right. And you believed he was a good actor? Correct? Yes. Okay. And then you provided an expert designation in this case before ever seeing Amber or having an opportunity to review any documents or records. Isn't that correct? I did not provide an expert designation. That's, that's an attorney thing. My opinions are contained in my report. Let's pull up Plaintiff's Exhibit 884, please. This was Plaintiff's Designation, Identification of Expert Witnesses in this case. And this is dated February 2021. That's a, a year after you went to dinner at Mr. Depp's house, correct? Yes. Okay. And it attributes, if you go to page 13, it says you have three opinions. The first of those is that Amber Heard, quote, exhibits patterns of behavior that are consistent with co-occurring cluster B personality disorder traits, especially borderline personality disorder. Did I get that right? I'm reading that here. That is not my opinion. Okay. Well, but it's, it's a current opinion. opinion, but this was not an opinion of mine then. I didn't have any opinions at that time. It says Dr. Curry will testify, correct? That's what it says, yes. Okay. And this is a signed pleading, correct, on behalf of Mr. Depp? I, I'm not sure I understand what that means. What? You don't understand what a signed pleading is? No. Okay. Do you understand that Mr. Depp's counsel prepared this and served it on Ms. Heard's counsel? I, I'm not an attorney. I don't understand necessarily all of these procedures. Okay. Are you aware that Mr. Depp is on an audio recording years earlier taunting Amber Heard that she has a borderline personality disorder? I was made aware of that in this case, yes. So you heard, did, is Actually, that one of the audio Actually, not necessarily taunting, but I do recall hearing that Mr. Depp had used that phrase. So it's a coincidence that you now think she has those attributes after the attorneys listed it in February 2021 before you'd looked at anything, and Mr. Depp had made that accusation to Ms. Heard years earlier. 
My opinions aren't based uh, on it, coincidence. Uh, it's an objection. Okay. I'm sorry, Dr. Okay. Abish. Yes. Compound, I'll sustain the objection. All right. It's a coincidence, then, that you came up with symptoms of borderline personality disorder years later after Mr. Depp has been taunting Ms. Heard in an audio tape. I can't them. speak to whether or not there's a coincidence. What I can tell you is my opinions are based on the results of my evaluation. And it's a coincidence that Mr. Depp's counsel attributed that to you, that said that to you in February 2021 before you'd looked at anything, correct? I'm not sure. Okay. Now, would you agree that a disproportionate number of women are tagged with a diagnosis of borderline personality disorder? No, that's not quite right. 75%? The way you phrase it is not quite right. Tell me, tell me what's right. Okay, so there are more women who have been diagnosed with bipolar disorder than men. It's more prevalent in women. And trauma can cause borderline personality disorders, can't it? No. Never? Right now, we know that there are people who have borderline personality disorder who have sustained childhood trauma. There are also people who have borderline personality disorder who have had no childhood trauma. So like most personality disorders and really like most mental health issues in general, there seems to be both a biological component. In this case with borderline personality disorder, the research tends to support a genetic component and possibly a neurological component. And then there is also possibly an environmental component triggering those genetic markers. Do you know the percentage of women who are victims of IPV, intimate partner violence or domestic abuse, who are diagnosed with borderline personality disorders? I can't tell you the percentage off of the top of my head, but I do know that there is a larger, women with borderline personality disorder tend to have a higher prevalence of being involved in intimate partner violence relationships, being the receiver of violence, and being the perpetuators of violence. Now, you've never been asked to testify or serve as an expert with respect to whether someone has a bipolar disorder. Is that correct? A bipolar disorder? Yes. That's not correct. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you. Do you recall having your deposition taken in this case? Yes. On March 21, 2022? I believe that was the date, yes. And were you under oath at that time? Yes. All right, I'm going to ask you to turn to page 207. And the question was, have you ever been asked to testify or serve as an expert with respect to whether someone has bipolar disorder? And your answer at that time, will you please read to the jury? I'm sorry, page 207? 207, line five. Ah. Could you no. read? No. Okay, thank you. Now, when this designation was served in February of 2021, you had not rendered an opinion that, quote, Ms. Hurd exhibits patterns of behavior that are consistent with co-occurring cluster B personality disorder traits, especially borderline personality disorder, correct? I'm sorry, I, I missed the first part. What was that? When this designation was served that you have in front of you as plaintiff's exhibit 884, oh, okay. you had not rendered an opinion that, quote, Ms. Hurd exhibits patterns of behavior that are consistent with co-occurring cluster B personality disorder traits, especially borderline personality disorder, correct? No, I had not rendered any opinions. My opinions weren't finalized until after my evaluation. Right. So when this came out, you had not rendered that opinion? I had not rendered that opinion. Okay. The second opinion that's listed in the February 2021 is that Ms. Heard repeatedly and characterologically 
perpetuated severe physical and psychological intimate partner violence, IPV, toward Mr. Depp over the course of their relationship. End of quote. Did I read that correctly? Uh, it says perpetrated, but other than that, yes. Okay. And so it, is it correct that they, that this pleading says in February 2021 that you are going to testify to that? This document, it, yes. yes. Okay. It says and, that. And you have never been asked to testify as to whether anyone has behaviorally or characterologically conducted conduct that suggests they may be an IPV perpetrator, correct? I have, to, I have to ask that again because I yes. stumbled. Okay. I can't Thank do you. characterologically. That one's just a okay. tough one for me. Okay. You have never been asked to testify as to whether anyone has behavioral or characterological conduct that suggests they may have been an IPV perpetrator, correct? No, I've never been asked to testify for that. Okay. And that was not your opinion in February 2021, correct? No. And in fact, you do not hold that opinion now and you were not even asked to provide such an analysis or opinion. Isn't that correct? No. Or that is correct. That's yes. correct. Okay. And you have never held that opinion, correct? No, that is correct. Yes. Okay. And your third opinion, if we can go to page 14, was that Ms. Hurd exhibits patterns of behavior that suggest her allegations of abuse against Mr. Depp are false. End of quote. Do you see that? I see that you said it's my third opinion. That is not my opinion. All right. But in this pleading, it says that you will testify to that, correct? Yes, that's what this says. Okay. And that was not your opinion in February 2021, was it? No, as I said, I had not formed any opinions at that time. I had just been retained. And in fact, you have never arrived at this opinion as an expert witness in this case, correct? In terms, no, the opinions that I've rendered are provided in my report. And, you and have, they're what I'm testifying to today. And you have never arrived at this opinion as an expert witness in this case, correct? I, uh, I'll sustain it. You have never arrived at the opinion that Ms. Hurd exhibits patterns of behavior that suggest her allegations of abuse against Mr. Depp are false, correct? That's correct. Okay. And in fact, you've said that has never been my opinion, correct? What I'm saying is that this, the opinions in here, I, these are not my opinions. My opinions are provided in my report. Can you please turn to page 255 of your deposition? And if we can start on 254 to give the I context. I don't have that page, I'm sorry. 254, line 11. Oh, okay. And the question is now, the next one is, quote, Ms. Hurd exhibits patterns of behavior that suggest her allegations of abuse against Mr. Depp are false, end of quote. Was that your opinion in February 2021? And you answered at that time, no, correct? That is correct. And then I asked, have you ever arrived at that opinion in the time that you have served as an expert witness in this case? And your answer was, could you read that to the jury, please? Yes. Um, so no, it's not the task I was cut off, or I essentially what I read, I, what I said then was, no, Dr. that's Curry. not the task okay. of Dash. That was never my task to determine. Can I say what that means? No. And then okay. the question is, so is it fair to say that you have never arrived at an opinion that, quote, Ms. Hurd exhibits patterns of behavior that suggest allegations of abuse against Mr. Depp are false, end of quote. And what was your answer? Well, there was an objection. All right. I'll, I'll, I'll read it for you if you're having difficulty. Okay. No, no, your no. answer was under oath, correct. That is not my opinion. That has never been my opinion. Isn't that what correct. you said under yes. oath on March 21st? And then I wrote, do you, then I'm going to ask you, do you know who wrote this portion of the designation suggesting that these were your opinions in February of 2021? And what was your answer? I said no. Okay. Now, as of the time of this initial expert designation, you had not reviewed any materials, re reached any opinions, correct? 
I believe I had just started to review materials. Um, I, I believe that I indicated that in my deposition. I had not yet rendered any opinions. I uh, had completed my review and I hadn't conducted an evaluation. Okay. And in fact, you've never testified as an expert on IPV, intimate partner violence. Isn't that correct? I believe that is correct, but I may not be remembering all of my cases. Oh, let's go to page 200. Okay. Line 17. My question was, have you ever testified as an expert on IPV? And your answer under oath then at line 22 was what? Oh gosh, let me catch up. Line 22. No. And you've never testified as an expert on emotional distress damages associated with IPV, is that correct? That's correct. Okay. And you've never been asked to testify with respect to emotional damages associated with domestic violence or abuse, isn't that correct? Uh, again, that, I'm reluctant to say that's correct because with 15 years of experiences, experience, a lot of my cases have been complex and that may have been a component, but I don't remember explicitly a case being just about that. Let's go Correct. to page 199, line 20. My question to you was, have you ever been asked to testify with respect to emotional damages associated with domestic violence or abuse? And your answer under oath at that time was? No. I've not, right? Sorry, that, I haven't that what found the said? page in time. Okay. You said, no, I've not. But I right? have not. Okay. Now, you also have never been asked to testify on whether an individual is being truthful in saying that they are a survivor of IPV. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. And you have never qualified as an expert to speak to whether a person suffered from IPV, intimate partner violence, or was a victim or survivor of IPV. Is that correct? That's outside the task of a psychologist to determine whether an event occurred. We assess behavior, we, have, we assess mental status, we don't detect crimes. So you have not been asked to testify to that, correct? It's not something that occurs, so no, I have not. And you were not ultimately asked to provide any opinions on that, correct? No, I was not. Okay. Now, you did not disclose in any of the designations or your report that you had met with and had dinner and drinks with Mr. Depp, did you? I'm sorry, can you repeat that one more yes. time? Yes, you did not me. disclose in any of the designations or in your report that you had dinner and drinks with Mr. Depp, correct? I did not disclose that I was interviewed by the legal team, no. I asked a different question. Are you trying to resist that you didn't have dinner with Mr. Depp and drinks? I'm not trying to resist that, but it's not quite right. You did have stating. dinner with Mr. Depp, did you not? I did. With and his you had legal drinks team with and Mr. Depp. Depp, did you not? And what? You had drinks with Mr. Depp, did you not? Drinks were served. I This was over two years ago. I may have had a drink with dinner, yes. In fact, you thought you had a mule something, right? Possibly. Yes. Okay. And you didn't disclose that you had met with Mr. Depp, Mr. Waldman, Mr. Chu, and Ms. Vasquez at Mr. Depp's house for three to four hours and had dinner and drinks, correct? I did not disclose that. It's not significant to the report. You don't think that's significant, correct? I don't. Okay. But you've never been asked to meet with a client in his counsel before being retained as an expert, either before or after, have you? No. And you justified that it was okay in this case because it was a high profile case. That's not quite right. I justified it in this case. Actually, I sought consultation about it. First of all, the person who had retained his attorneys was unable to come to my office with his attorneys. And yes, this is a very visible case. It's been going on a very long time. And I understood that there would be a need to interview me and determine, make an informed decision about my qualifications. Can you look at page 240, please? Okay. 
Line three is my question. Would you agree it's a highly irregular to meet with the subject in a litigation? And your answer on that occasion was, I would not say it's highly irregular. I would say it's not something that I would typically do. However, I had not yet been retained on the case. This was a large, high-profile case, and I understood that I believed that it was appropriate for a person retaining me with such a high profile to meet me, to be able to vet me, essentially with the attorneys present prior to retaining me on his case. Do you recall that? Yes. That's what you said under oath, correct? Yes. And then I said, have you ever done that before? And you said, no. Correct? correct. And then I said, have you ever done it since? And you said, no. Correct? Correct. Okay. Now, would you agree that if you did not find something that would be in favor of Mr. Depp and a negative to Ms. Hurd, that you wouldn't be an expert in this case? That Essentially, you into court if, you, if you're going to say that Ms. Hurd is right and Mr. Depp is wrong. Correct? So as a forensic psychologist, my obligation is to the court, is to the fact finder. I present science regardless of what that science may be. Now, when I take a case, my retainer agreement is explicit about that, and I Do, discuss Dr. that Perry, with I'm the attorneys. Asking you, I'm asking you a question. I'd like you to try to answer okay. my question. You understand that if you found favorably to Ms. Hurd and negatively to Mr. Depp, you wouldn't be here, right? You wouldn't be testifying. No, I, okay, sorry, hold on. The objection is speculation. I, I, that's, that's not speculation. No, I'll sustain the objection if you want to ask. Okay. If, it goes to bias, Your Honor. I sustain the objection. Next question. Okay, all right. You were, in fact, so excited about being involved in this case that you told your husband, even though this was a highly confidential matter, that you were going to be conducting the examination of Ms. Hurd, didn't you? That is not accurate. You not only told your husband, but you told Ms. Hurd that you told your husband, correct? Ms. Bredehoff, that is not accurate. What is accurate? You're incorrect. That is not correct. You, you, is your testimony today under oath that you did not tell your husband that you were going to be conducting the examination of Amber? That is my testimony. Okay. Let's go to page 306. So the question that was asked was because you brought muffins, you said, from your husband, right? You get, and you gave those to Ms. Hurd, correct? May I clarify what occurred so that we can stop talking about the muffins? What happened was that I was getting ready that morning. I frequently bring muffins to the office. My husband did happen to know that there was going to be a celebrity client coming in because on the mornings that that occurs, which often occurs, we have to actually clear the office and move the staff to the other office. So yes, on the one hand, he was aware of that. I was getting ready. I asked him to go to the bakery near our house and pick up the muffins for me because I was running late. He often has to do that because I often do run late. He brought the muffins back to the house. I brought them into the office. Ms. Hurd and I enjoyed the muffins together. I think I made a comment to her along the lines like, we can thank my husband. He brought, or my husband got these for us today, meaning he purchased the muffins. We are now enjoying them because of him. Did, did you say on pages 305 and 306 that you frequently have examinations of high profile clients? You want to just take a quick look and tell us? Uh, what, 305, 306? Yeah, that's where we're talking about it. Is there a line you'd like me to look at? You can start with uh, 15, line 15, 305. Just read through that and tell me whether you said anywhere in there that you have a lot of high profile examinations. You do this frequently. I don't agree. Why don't you approach, please?
So why did your husband get the muffins for Amber Heard? He did not get the muffins for Amber Heard. He knew you had a high profile client and he was and you were preparing for a very long time and you asked him to pick up the muffins, correct? I asked him to pick up the muffins for me, yes. Okay. Now, would you agree that domestic abuse can be verbal? Absolutely, yes. Would you agree that domestic abuse can be emotional? Yes, certainly. Would you agree that domestic abuse can be psychological? Yes. Would you agree that domestic abuse can be physical? Yes. Okay. Now, you indicated, and I believe you testified in your direct, that it's very important to review the treatment records before forming opinions. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. In fact, that's the first thing you would do, correct? Not necessarily the first, but it's part of the evaluation. Go to page 261. And let's go to 260 because that's where I start the question. The question I asked was, and do you recall whether you'd review any of, of these by the designation on February 19, 2021? And you said, okay, I can't say for certain. What I can tell you is that knowing my normal procedure, I would have reviewed the treatment records first. Did you testify to that under oath then? Yes. Okay. Now, before we start getting into the ones that you testified about, I just want to be really clear about what you actually uh, have as an opinion with respect to the borderline personality disorder and the histrionics. You didn't diagnose, you didn't actually have a DSM-5 diagnosis that Amber Heard suffers from either borderline personality disorder or histrionic personality disorder, correct? That's not correct. Your, in fact, your report says Ms. Heard demonstrates psychological symptoms of a combined borderline and histrionic personality disorder. Would you agree? Yes, I did say that in also what designation was that? I believe January 18th that report was included? Yes. Okay. And that's what you said at that time, correct? Yes. Okay. I said a little bit more than that as well. You said, and I'll read it, I'll quote it, quote, based on the combined results of my interview with Ms. Heard, behavioral observations, psychometric test data, and review of the available records, Ms. Heard demonstrates psychological symptoms mm -hmm of a combined borderline and histrionic personality disorder, BHPD. That's yes. what you wrote in your report as one of your conclusions, correct? And that's a DSM-5 diagnosis. And it did not say that you were diagnosing with a DSM-5 for borderline personality disorder or histrionic personality disorder, did it? That's what it says in different semantics. Oh, so... so so what you meant to it say... It did not use the words you just said. Now, let's talk about the treatment records that you said that you reviewed. But I'm going to start with Rocky Pennington. Your testimony was that out of the blue, Amber hit R Rocky Pennington, correct? I can't remember exactly what I said, but I did reference Ms. Pennington's deposition that Ms. Hurd struck Ms. Pennington in the face. In yes. fact... Ms. Pennington testified that she hit Ms. Hurd, and in response to that, she can't recall, but Ms. Hurd either pushed or slapped her, correct? I don't recall. That's a pretty important distinction, don't you think? My recollection is that there was some sort of violence both ways in the relationship. Either way, it seemed that both of them might have been unstable. Uh, oh, I'm we, only evaluating Ms. Hurd. So, so now we have an evaluation of Rocky Pennington? No, from, I just said, but that was not relevant to my opinion because I'm only evaluating Ms. Hurd. But you testified to that on direct that that was a factor, right? Yes. Okay. Well, wouldn't it make a big difference if Amber struck first or just responded back? Given the dynamic, not necessarily. No, it would not have. So, so now you're an expert on Rocky Pennington and her dynamics with a Amber Heard. Yeah, oh, okay, so Draw. now let's talk about Dr. Cowan. You not only reviewed his treatment records and his text messages and documents, but you also attended his deposition, did you not? Yes. 
Okay. And do you recall Dr. Cowan testifying that Amber told him about Depp physically abusing her contemporaneous with the events? I don't recall specifically his words, but I remember him recalling that she had disclosed abuse in their treatment, yes. And do you recall Dr. Cowan testifying that he received a text message contemporaneous uh, that Johnny did a number on me tonight. I'm safe in my support tonight, but I need some real help. Do you remember him testifying to that? I don't remember the testimony, but I do remember seeing that text message as one of the exhibits. And do you remember Dr. Cowan testifying that on another occasion, Amber sent him a text, Johnny beat me up pretty good last night, end of quote. Again, I... Not in this constant. She she's can oh, rely on it. She oh, testified. Over, over rule. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Your Honor. I didn't need to argue that hard, I guess. Do you recall that? Again, I don't recall the testimony, but I do remember that being an exhibit. I've seen it. Do you recall Dr. Cowan testifying that not only did he believe Amber in her reporting of the abuse by Depp, but that she had no ulterior motive? I actually don't recall that. I'm not saying that it didn't occur. Do you recall Dr. Cowan testifying that he believed the relationship was toxic and he was concerned for Amber's physical well-being? I do recall him saying that he believed the relationship was toxic. And you don't recall Dr. I do not. Cowan saying that he was concerned for Amber's physical well-being? I don't remember those exact words. Do you believe, do you recall Dr. Cowan testifying in that deposition that you were present for, referring to Mr. Depp, quote, his controlling nature, jealousy and suspiciousness, addiction to drugs and alcohol, and violent and indulgent temper? Do you recall him using those terms to describe Mr. Depp? I remember thinking that would be an inappropriate impression for a treating provider of a different person to give, um, but I do recall him making that statement. Do you recall Dr. Cohen testifying that if he pushed her, she was going to push him back? And I never had the impression that she was the provocateur, but that she was indicating to me she had a hard time, you know, de-escalating these types of situations. Yes. Okay. And do you also recall him saying that she didn't say she pushed him, she just said, I got right back up. He told me that, she told me that he pushed her down and she got back right back up. I remember him saying that Ms. Hurd told him that, yes. And do you recall him testifying you could interpret it that way? I kind of interpret it more, you know, metaphorically, that when somebody comes at her, she goes back at them, you know, in a similar way, whether it's verbally or she protects herself. Do you uh, recall that? I, I may, I recall something along those lines, but it was a six or seven hour deposition, so the specifics are not fresh in my mind. Do you recall Dr. Cowan specifically testifying that he believed Amber Heard when she reported the physical abuse by Mr. Depp? I recall him saying that and following it up with a statement that you have to take the patient at their word when you're the therapist. You recall that? Yes. Do you recall him saying he took her, that he believed her? That he found her believable? Yes, yes, that he found her believable. Okay. Um, now, you also testified about Tony Banks. Do you recall that? Yes. And before we go there, Dr. Cowan has been a clinical psychologist for 40 years, correct? I'm not sure. Okay. Well, he testified to that, didn't he, in the deposition? I don't recall. And he also saw Amber Heard for over two years, correct? Yes. From 2014, approximately August 2014 to... 2000 through 2016, correct? Yes, he did. For a period of time, would you mm -hmm. agree? Okay. And he also testified that he did not diagnose Amber with borderline personality disorder. Do you recall that testimony? He also testified that he doesn't use diagnoses, but yes, I do recall that. And do you recall that it was in, the, those words were in his notes, but he said he had written that down, but then he discounted and, and determined that that was not correct for her. Oh, you want to approach? All right, now let's jump to Amy Banks. 
Dr. Banks is a psychiatrist, correct? Correct. Yes. And in fact, she went to medical school at Georgetown, and she did her psychiatric training at Harvard Medical School. Correct. I believe that's correct. I don't recall 100 okay. percent. All right. And she uh, was a psychiatrist in Massachusetts that Amber Heard had reached out to yes. after the Australia incident to try to help her relationship with Mr. Depp. Correct. Let me back up. You attended Dr. Banks' deposition as well, did you not? Yes, I did. And Dr. Banks testified to that, correct? Uh, I don't remember if she testified to that. I don't have the notes right in front of me or the deposition transcript. All right. Do, do you recall Dr. Banks testifying that she understood that Amber was in a relationship with Johnny Depp that had gotten violent and out of control? I, I don't recall specifically, no. Do you recall Amy Banks testifying that they had physical altercations and his drug use had escalated and Amber felt she was at risk? I don't recall. Do you recall Amy Banks testifying that Amber was reporting the violence by Mr. Depp and it was not consensual? I recall Dr. Banks stating that Ms. Hurd was reporting violence to her, yes. I do not recall a statement about consent. Do you recall Dr. Banks testifying that there was discussion about Mr. Depp cutting off his finger and she said only that it was a middle of one of these very kind of out of control escalated fights and that did make a fairly big impact on me? I remember something like that. And do you recall Dr. Banks saying it was a whole other level? As I remember, it told to me he actually cut off a part of his finger during one of these altercations, meaning to me, the way I digested that, if you will, was that things had gotten particularly out of control. I do not recall that exact statement. I'm not saying it didn't occur. I just can't recall it. All right. And you recall that Mr. Depp was in sessions with Ms. Hurd with Dr. Banks, correct? I, yes. Okay. My understanding, however, is that they met with Dr. Banks and then it was primarily Ms. Hurd meeting with Dr. Banks for treatment after prescriptions and therapy. All right. And do you recall Dr. Banks saying that she was not surprised that Amber was seeking a re restraining order because of the violence that she knew existed in the relationship? I do recall that and it would be impossible to know that violence exists as a treating therapist or as a psychologist. Again, we're not investigators. However, I do recall that she said that because I remember having that thought. And do you recall Amy, and she's a psychiatrist, right? Psychiatrist. Okay. And do you recall Amy Banks saying that it was clear to her that Mr. Depp was the one who initiated the violence? I don't recall that. All right. Do you recall that Dr. Banks said that she knew for certain that Mr. Depp was the one who, who had committed the violence because Ms. Hurd reported it in the presence of Mr. Depp and he did not contradict. I do not recall that. Okay. And do you recall that Dr. Banks ultimately concluded that it was her belief that Amber was a victim of domestic violence at the hands of Mr. Depp? Clear. Do you want to close? And what was your answer to that last one? I'm sorry. I uh, think I can't recall, but I also can't recall that last question. Do you recall that Dr. Banks concluded that Amber was a victim of domestic violence at the hands of Mr. Depp? I don't recall that. Okay. Now, 
You also reviewed the records of Laurel Anderson and you reviewed her deposition, is that correct? Um, let me uh, refresh my memory for a moment. Uh, um, I reviewed uh, Dr. Anderson's deposition, yes. Okay, and do you recall that she reported that, that Amber Heard had, had reported physical violence by Mr. Depp to her? I recall that she said that Ms. Heard had reported that, yes. Okay, and do you recall that she said that it, it changed over time? I don't recall that specifically. Okay, and do you recall Dr. Anderson saying that she had witnessed her face being bruised after the December 15, 2015 incident? I don't recall that. You don't recall that, okay. Um, And do you recall that Dr. Anderson said that Amber had reported that uh, he had pulled out her hair, bruised her face, kicked her leg, and hit her in the head? Yes, Ms. Heard did report that to her according to her testimony. Okay. And do you recall that Amber Heard said that Mr. Depp was scaring her? I don't recall that specifically. Okay. And do you recall that Dr. Anderson said she believed that Amber Heard was a victim of domestic abuse at the hands of Mr. Depp. I recall, uh, no, I don't recall that statement. All right, let's go to Bonnie Jacob. You said that you reviewed the notes from Bonnie Jacob, correct? Yes. And what you testified to was that you discounted these because the first notes from Bonnie Jacobs indicated that she already had all of these symptoms, correct? Just, I'm sorry, I don't understand what you're saying. I discounted. Tell, tell, tell me why you discounted Bonnie Jacobs' notes. I did not discount Bonnie Jacobs' notes. You said that she, that Bonnie Jacobs in her notes had already determined that these symptoms were present for Amber Heard before the relationship with Mr. Depp, did you not? What I recall saying was that within Dr. Jacobs's notes, she's documented instances in which Ms. Heard reported to her over the course of therapy that she was experiencing nightmares, recurrent nightmares, in fact, about childhood abuse. Okay. Now, the very first entry on Bonnie Jacobs' notes, and th these are the notes, right? Do you recognize these? I do, and okay. we received more uh, sort of at the tail end just a couple months ago. All right, so the first of Bonnie Jacobs' notes is on 10-17-2011. Do you recall that? I, I don't recall the exact date. I don't have anything in front of me. And she was already, Amber Heard was already in the relationship with Johnny Depp at this point, was she not? I believe she was, yes. Okay, and in Bonnie Jacobs' notes, she documents, however, oh, Go ahead. She documents multiple, multiple occasions that Amber Heard reports to her physical violence uh, upon her by Mr. Depp, does she not? There are several notes that indicate that Ms. Heard has reported violence by Mr. Depp, yes. Many, many, correct? I wouldn't qualify it as many, many. I'm not sure what you mean how, by how, many, many. How many would you? Say. I don't know. I don't have the notes in front of me. Okay. Well, what do you recall in deciding to make your opinions in this case? Well, I'm confused about the dates because I know that Dr. Jacobs treated Ms. Hurd even while she was in her prior relationship, leaving her prior relationship with her last wife. Uh, Dr. Curry, I'm not going to ask you to try to bring in extraneous things. I'm asking you what you recall of these But notes. the dates would have been different based on that alone. Okay. And I recall that there was quite a bit of information because these were copious notes spanning back in time from her relationship with Tasha. So Dr. Dr. Curry, please answer my question. How many occasions do you recall Dr. I don't know. Dr. Jacobs documenting Amber reporting physical abuse? I don't know. Now, you also said that you listened to audio tapes in this case, correct? Yes. Did you hear Mr. Depp admitting to headbutting Ms. Heard? That is not what I heard. You didn't hear that? I heard a conversation about headbutting. I did not hear him, as you said, admit to headbutting Ms. Heard. Okay, that's your characterization of it, correct? 
Yes. Okay. Um, the, did you see the videotape of Mr. Depp in the kitchen? Yes. Okay. Did Ms. Heard imagine that or create that, or was she responsible for that somehow? I'll sustain the objection next question. Okay. Um, what, if any, impact did you have, did that have on your opinions watching Mr. Depp in that video? I'm not sure it, it was one of many pieces of the exhibits and other collateral data that I considered. I'm not sure what the direct impact was or if that could be measured. All right. Now, counsel asked you whether you had conducted any type of examination on Mr. Depp, and I believe your answer was no, correct? No. You did not review any medical records or psychological records from Mr. Depp either, did you? I reviewed all of the records that were available. Do, do you recall reviewing medical and psychological rec records I, on Mr. I, Depp? Yes. Do you recall Dr. Blaustein referring to Mr. Depp having rage? No, I actually recall him referring to Ms. Hurd in that note. Your testimony is that Dr. Blaustein was referring to Amber Hurd as having rage? I transcribed several of the notes, and I may be missing a time when he I said that about Mr. Depp. The handwriting was very difficult to transcribe, but there was one instance in which I recall transcribing him stating that Mr. Depp reported that Ms. Hurd had rage. D Dr. Blaustein's deposition was taken, was it not? Uh, I don't recall. Do you recall, uh, so I take it then you don't recall him testifying that Mr. Depp told him he had rage and demons? I don't recall. Do you recall Dr. Blaustein testifying that Mr. Depp looked at his wife, Amber, like his mother or his sister that he didn't like? I haven't seen his deposition. I don't recall that. Okay. Now, did you see and do you know whether Mr. Depp has ever been diagnosed with any personality disorders? My, that's not relevant to my task to conduct an evaluation of Ms. Hurd. So, so would it, would I, I do not know that he has had one. It was not in the records that he did. All right. So one way or the other, you don't know whether Mr. Depp suffers from any personality disorders. There was, that's not my task. Okay. Let me go to uh, IPV perpetrators. Would you agree that accusations of infidelity can be considered one of the characteristics of a personality perpetrator of IPV? It can be a characteristic of a lot of things. It is something that can be weaponized if somebody is trying to or is having rage toward their partner. Let's go to page 270. Line three, my question was, are accusations of infidelity considered one of the characteristics of a perpetrator, a personality perpetrator of IPV? The objection. Um, it, the question is, is is vague and ultimately ambiguous. I, I don't understand the objection. I, I'll overrule the objection. Okay. And your answer under oath Can at that time. Can you remind me of the page? I thought page was... 270, line 3 uh, was where my question was. Okay. And your answer is at line 8. You said it can be, correct? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. And interrogating your partner about unfounded accusations of infidelity can be abusive. Would you agree? It can be if they're unfounded, yes. Okay. Um, and psychological consequences for a victim of IPV can include diminished self-esteem, correct? Yes. Depressed mood? Yes. Anxiety? Yes. Fearfulness? Certainly. Diminished self-agency? Yes. Feeling powerless? Yes. Loss of sleep? Yes. An IPV is a traumatic stressor, would you agree? It is. All right. An IPV is capable of resulting in PTSD, is it not? It is. Okay. An IPV is capable of resulting in other trauma-based disorders, correct? Uh, yes. Okay. 
Now, Amber's medical examination, she was cooperative, correct? Her psychological, yes. She okay. was cooperative and polite. Okay. And, and in the two full days of examination, you felt she was polite and answered all your questions, except in one instance where she furrowed her brow when you were asking about friendships in high school, correct? That's not correct. All right, let's go to page 275. So we start on 274 with the, was she polite? You said yes. Was she cooperative? Yes. Um, did she answer your questions? For the most part, yes. This is, uh, now we're on page 275, lines four and five. And then my question was, did she at any time become combat combative or unfriendly with you or angry? And your answer was, there was one instance in which she appeared annoyed and the posturing forward a bit, more assertive tone, furrowed brow, when I was questioning something, following up on data that had been inconsistent about friendships in high school. Other than that, she was very polite. Is that your answer at that time? That was my answer at that time, and it's inconsistent with the question you had just asked me. And would you agree that appearing for this examination with an expert who had been retained by Mr. Depp more than a year earlier might be a little stressful? Yes. And in fact, not only had you been retained by Mr. Depp, but what had been communicated by Mr. Depp's team was that you had called Amber Heard a liar and a perpetrator of abuse, correct? First of all, I, I'd like to clarify that I was not retained by Mr. Depp. I was retained by Mr. Depp's counsel. And what I can say that, yes, any examinee in a forensic context, you would consider that they're probably stressed. All right, would you agree that all perpetrators of IPV have anger management issues? Yes. And a large portion of IPV perpetrators have substance abuse issues? Not, uh, it, it's one of many factors that correlates with intimate partner violence, but there are certainly many people who perpetuate intimate partner violence who do not have substance abuse issues. All right, let's go to 131, line 17. One thirty-one, you said? Yes, line 12 is what I have here. And I'm talking about, you said, and just to give context, remember I was asking you how many, what percentage of uh, people you treat that are perpetrators, and you'd said 5%. Do you recall that, just for substance? I see that here. Okay. And then I, then I said, um, of the 5% that are IPV perpetrators that you've treated over the last eight years, how many of these perpetrators have substance abuse issues? And your answer was? I see that I answered with a figure of speech, a large portion. Okay, thank you. And it's common for the perpetrator to essentially gaslight the victim, accuse them of being the perpetrator. Are Would you agree? Are you in a different area or are you asking me a question? I'm asking question? you a question. Oh, um, and it's common. sorry, can you please repeat it? Yes, and it's common for the perpetrator to essentially gaslight the victim, accuse them of being the perpetrator. Would you agree? That's exactly how it was asked in the deposition. So I'm I to be it is a compound question. I'll okay. the objection. And it's common for the perpetrator to essentially gaslight. I don't think that's, Your Honor, it's just, I think it's just one question. Um, <laughs> let me try it. To gaslight the victim, isn't it? That's a characteristic of psychological abuse, yes. Okay. And, and it's common then for them to accuse them of being the perpetrator, the victim. That's a characteristic of abuse from women perpetrated against men. It's actually very, very common. About 90% of male victims of IPV have reported that a female partner who abuses them makes threats to uh, report their partner as an abuser. It's less common for men to make that statement to female partners just because there's less potential consequence. Isn't it true, though, that some form of gaslighting is often present in these personality-based IPV scenarios? Yes. Okay. 
And it's distressing for the victim to be accused, is it not? Absolutely. It causes them a lot of fear? Certainly. And it causes them a lot of distress? Absolutely, yes. And in fact, they feel falsely accused, correct? Yes. And they feel paranoid? Yes. And they feel frightened? Yes. Afraid that everyone's going to believe the perpetrator, correct? Yes. And in fact, they're afraid they're going to lose their security, correct? Can you clarify what you mean by security? I'll ask the next one. And they're afraid they're going to lose their reputation, correct? Yes. Now let's talk about the testing for a moment. You talked about the MMPI-2, but that's not the most recent MMPI, is it? No, it's the most researched. Okay. Now, you, you need to have an elevated, uh, on the MMPI, there was only one section that had elevated uh, elevated scores, correct? No, that's not correct. It was the K section, correct? That's not correct. Okay. And was there any elevated score over 65 on the MMPI? I would need to take a look at it. If you know, I provided a 25 page interpretation outline. If you're able to pull that up, I'd be happy to go over any of the individual scores for you. Can you recall any clinical scales for the MMPI2 for Amber Heard that were above 65 as you sit there today? Again, there are multiple, multiple scales on this test, 25 pages worth listed. So if you can pull it up, then I can review and give you a competent answer. What can you recall as you sit there? I, I'm hesitant to do that because I don't want to make an error by ignoring hundreds of scale scores. And would you agree that you can't make a pathological determination or diagnosis if the scales are not elevated on the MMPI-2? I would not agree with that. Okay. Now, one of the answers that Amber gave is that it's hard for her to feel safe, correct? What are we, are you talking about the MMPI-2? Yes. Again, I don't recall. There are 567 items on that. I would need to see her results. Well, it's a common trauma symptom, isn't it, to not feel safe? Sure. And safety concerns are common among women who have been victimized, correct? Women and men, yes. Okay, and common especially for sexually victimized people. Would you agree? Any, any type of victimization, yes. And hard to trust, that's a common after effect of interpersonal violence related trauma, correct? Sure. And memory dif difficulties, Amber said she felt she had holes. Do you recall that? I do, and, and her it, account was different than typical me memory difficulties with trauma. It is, it is common for individuals who have experienced trauma. I, and it's actually not have. common, no. It's a symptom, but it's the least common. In fact, a DSM-5 diagnosis for PTSD includes a, quote, inability to remember an important aspect of the traumatic event, end mm -hmm. of quote. Am I correct? Yes. Okay. And memory difficulties are a symptom of PTSD, correct? Certain types of memory difficulties, yes. Okay. Now, do you recall when Amber says the first incident of abuse took place? I believe it was, oh, the first incident in which she, yes, so she stated that it was early on in their relationship. Okay. Do you recall it? I don't recall the exact date off the top of my head. Do you recall it being a tattoo, something related to a tattoo? I do. Okay. Now, if someone had been subjected to a four-year relationship characterized by repeated IPV, they can have symptoms, correct? Yes. Intense anxiety? Yes, certainly. Depressed or irritable states? Actually, this it's not so much states. When you're looking at a real trauma reaction, it's pretty uh, persistent. It's less of these transient states. Intimate problems? Yes. Relationship difficulties? Yes. And these are symptoms you're also attributing to the personality disorder, correct? Yes, there are some key differences. Okay. 
Now let's talk for a moment specifically about a couple of the uh, profiles on the MMPI. This is not an exaggerated profile for her, is it? No, actually that was something unique. When she completed objective broadband measures where the questions, you, you don't know what the questions are getting at, they seem completely random. She uh, raised scores that indicated that she was trying to minimize any mental issues and, and appear completely free of pathology. When she took tests that asked questions that were specific to trauma, that's when you'd see these extreme exaggerations. All right, let's go to page 337. My question on line seven, this is not an exaggerated profile, is it for her? And your answer under oath at that time was no, it is not an exaggerated profile. Do you see that? Yes, That's we're talking about the MMPI here. You yes. testified under oath at that time, correct? Yes, that's okay. correct. Now, the profile is also not consistent with malingering, correct? The MMPI two profile, it's specific to how she approached this test. And you're correct. For this test, it was a defensive profile, not an exaggerated profile. So my question on line 10 was, this is not a profile consistent with malingering, correct? And your answer under oath at that time was correct. On this test, it is not consistent with malingering, period, right? Yes. That was your full answer. Okay. Now, is it your testimony under oath today that you have not been asked to testify concerning Ms. Hurd's behavior in the context of her relationship with Mr. Depp, including any abuse. That's correct. Okay. And you have not made any determinations, including any uh, of opinions that Ms. Ms. Hurd abused Mr. Depp or Mr. Depp abused Ms. Hurd, correct? Correct, that's outside of the scope of psychology. Okay. And you cannot testify whether Amber Heard suffered any emotional distress as a result of any of the defamatory comments that she has alleged Mr. Waldman made through Mr. Mr. Depp made through Mr. Waldman, correct? What I can testify is that there was no indication of a decline in psychological functioning showing any injury since she's been with Mr. Depp. You, you cannot testify one way or the other on that, correct? Your Honor, may we approach? Okay. Dr. Curry. Yes. In your report, nowhere in your report did you uh, provide any opinion of whether Ms. Hurd suffered emotional distress as a result of the defamatory statements. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay, thank you. I have no further questions. All right, redirect. Dr. Curry, you were just asked a question about malingering. Yes and made reference to the MMPI-2. Is there another test that you did to make a determination with respect to malingering? Yes, so I also, well, malingering is a term that most psychologists, we try to be careful of it because it indicates an intent for secondary gain. I prefer feigning, which you had brought up earlier, because it indicates that somebody is intentionally exaggerating, but I don't know necessarily why. 
So I think that's a more accurate term in general. Um, on the MMPI-2, yes, there was no exaggerated profile. I also gave her, though, the CAPS-5. I don't know if you'll remember, but that is the clinician-administered PTSD scale consistent with the DSM-5. And on that, there were signs of gross exaggeration. I also um, looked at the test results that were provided by Dr. Hughes. And on an objective test of trauma, um, there is a scale specific to intentional exaggeration on that test. And Ms. Hurd was in the 98th, profile, 98th percentile, meaning that she is, uh, she indicates she had engaged in extreme levels of exaggeration. Thank you. Uh, you were asked about uh, intimacy problems, relationship difficulties associated with IPV, and, and you, you then said that there were some key differences. Yes. What are those? So what you see when we're talking about the personality disorders is there is a very consistent pattern of the aggression, the violence, the irritability. First of all, it's escalated. But second of all, it occurs when there is either, for the borderline component, a threat of abandonment, a perceived slight, feeling like the person is about to leave you, about to walk away to get some space from an argument. It's all. It also occurs to a le more mild extent, but when there's a loss of attention and a need to manipulate to try to get that attention back, but it's not, when somebody has PTSD, that irritability is sort of at a low, constant level, or it's completely random. For instance, you might have a Vietnam vet who went straight to bars for a period to get into fights with the hope that he would kill somebody and just self-destruct. So it's a very different type of presentation. IPV, it might be more irritability, but that's actually less of a symptom for female IPV victims. Usually what you'll see is somatic symptoms, the depression, a lot of fearfulness and anxiety, but typically more complaints about somatic symptoms. Okay. You testified that uh, some uh, of the professionals involved in this case had to take their patient at her word. What did you mean by that? So when you're providing therapy, you're in a very different role than an examiner. When you're the forensic examiner, you're just really looking at data to make a decision. When you're a therapist, you're an advocate for your client's well-being. And in fact, it's considered extremely unethical for a treating provider to ever provide um, opinion testimony like I'm providing because it's so well known in our field that you're going to have an automatic bias for your client. It's almost a, a sense of protection, advocacy, wanting their best, which is why we also know that it's very inappropriate to um, convey any sort of opinion about whether a crime occurred, whether abuse occurred. We can certainly believe our clients. We can support them in their therapy and take them at their word. But when giving opinions and consultations, we have to be very, very cautious and really only provide the, the facts. We would state things in terms of, my client did report this. I saw this. Here was our treatment plan. Here was the diagnosis. It's, uh, we just, we're taught, we're trained to stay away from making any sort of opinions, understanding that most of the time and most of Ms. Hurd's providers were just treating Ms. Hurd. They had never so much as done an uh, initial, evalu or initial interview with Mr. Depp and gotten his whole life story or his symptoms or his side of any of it. Um, and they're going to be advocating. And, and the treatment relationship is about helping your client achieve well-being, not making uh, formal psychological or psych psychiatric opinions. So you're asked a, a question about a series of doctors. Dr. Cohen, treating physician? Yes, he was a psychologist. Yeah. Dr. Banks? Treating physician? Dr. Banks, yes, treating psychiatrist. Dr. Anderson? Yes, uh, treating psychologist. Every one of them had to take Amber Word at, Andrew Heard at his word, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, overruled on that. Thank you. No further questions. All right. Is this witness subject? Yes, sorry. Uh, is this witness subject to recall? Yes. No. All right. Since you're subject to recall, Dr. Curry, please do not uh, 
discuss your testimony with anybody and please do not watch uh, anything of this trial. Okay. okay? All right. Got thank it. you. Thank you. You can stay there for a moment. Okay. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we'll go ahead and take our afternoon recess for 15 minutes. Do not do any outside research and don't talk to anybody. Okay. Let's go ahead and take our recess till 320. Your next witness is by deposition, is that correct? We will get you all set up then. All right, thank you. Oh, okay, we'll come back at 320 before the jury comes back out. We'll discuss your exhibits, okay? All right, thank you.
you want to say just a few Sure. Well, do you approach? Sure. Are they agreed on? Or?
right. We're ready for the jury then? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Your next witness. Uh, we call Officer Melissa Sines by deposition designation. All right. like and answer. just so the jury is aware, uh, for the first hour or so, what we'll hear is questioning by Ms. Hurd's counsel. Uh, it will then shift to questioning by Mr. Depp's counsel. All right. Thank you. Please state your name and your business address. Yes. Um, Officer Melissa Sines. 1546 West Martin Luther King Jr. Boulevard, Los Angeles, California. And what is your occupation? I am a police officer. Okay. And how long have you been a police officer? Uh, going on 12 years. When, what year did you begin as a police officer? 2009. And was that with the LAPD? Yes, it was. Did you have any law enforcement experience prior to coming to the LAPD in July of 2009? No, I did not. As of May 21, 2016, what was your rank? Can you repeat the date? May 21st, 2016. I was a training officer. And was that a P3? Correct. And as a training officer, were you considered a field training officer? Correct. Right. And for how long a period of time had you been a training officer as of May 21, 2016? Approximately, I believe four months. And who was the first officer you trained once you became a training officer at the LAPD? I don't recall. When did you start training Officer Haddon? I, I don't recall the exact month. Do you have an approximate? Uh, if the incident was in May, then it's going to be within uh, two months of May, before or after. So, are you suggesting that you may not have started training Officer Haddon until two months after the May 21, 2016 incident, so he wasn't there? No, I'm not. Was it two months or less from the time you started training Officer Haddon? before the May 21, 2016 incident? Yes, so I have a probationer for two months. So May could have been the second month I had him or the first month I had him. But you don't recall as you sit here today, how long you have been training officer Haddon as of the May 21st, 2016 incident? All right. What does Central Division include? It encompass downtown Los Angeles. In May of 2016, what shift were you on? I was working nights. And, and what would the night shift entail? What was the time from when to when? It is approximately 6.45 p.m. to 6.45 a.m. 
And how many days a week would you work the shift? Usually three days a week. Typically, what was the range of the number of units that were working on your shift in May 2016 in Central Division? I, I don't recall. I, I mean, are we talking less than five, more than 10, more than 25? There would be at least five units. How high over that, I, I wouldn't know that. Every Again, every night is different. The city pulls from different divisions if there's special events going on. So it's constantly changing. Okay. Um, but it's usually at least five and maybe somewhere between five and 10 if there's not a special event, would that be a fair estimate? Correct. What was the process for checking out equipment in May 2016 after roll call? We would walk to the window and give them our name and serial number and they would present us with equipment for the shift. And what equipment were you given in May 2016 after roll call? I don't recall. You don't recall any of the equipment you would be checked out in May of 2016 after roll call? I don't remember that specific day that I checked out equipment. I can tell you what I typically check out, if that's what you like. All right, let's start there. I usually check out a police vehicle, a taser, a less lethal beanbag shotgun and a regular shotgun. Anything else? No, nothing else. Do you check out body worn video equipment? Yes, if you were trained in body worn video, then yes, you would check that out. All right. Were you trained in body worn video equipment? I was not. Have you ever been assigned body-worn video equipment? Yes, I have. When? I don't remember the specific date. What is your best estimate? If I had to guess, it would probably be June of 2016. Why do you think it was June of 2016 that you first were assigned the body worn video equipment? Because that's the time frame that I remember having to use it. It was new to me. I never used body worn before. When did the LAPD start issuing body worn equipment for Central Division? I don't know that date. When approximately? I don't know, I couldn't give you a date. Can you name any other officer that did not have body worn equipment that was on your shift at any time between November 2015 and June 2016, other than you? I cannot. Have you had more than one body worn video equipment Body worn camera, is that what you're asking? Yes. I have had two, one in Central Division and now a new one at Southwest Division where I currently am. The camera stays at their respective divisions. While you were at Central Division, did you ever get assigned more than one body worn video camera? Not to my knowledge. So to the best of your knowledge, you had the same body worn video camera throughout the time that you were at Central Division, is that correct? Correct. Do you have a recollection of at any time while you were at Central Division, your body worn video camera not working so you couldn't turn it on during an incident? I do not recall that. What tools were available to you 
in May of 2016 for investigating calls, answering and investigating calls. Can you specify what you mean by tools? Well, did you have a notebook, for example? Yes, we carry field officers' notebooks. Okay. And did you have your own field officer notebook? Yes. Can you describe what your field officer notebook looked like in May of 2016? It's a small, just paper pad that we keep in our pockets to write on. And do you carry a pencil or a pen with it so that you can take them out during a call and take notes? I do. What do you do with your notebooks once you have filled them? You can turn them into the kit room and they can store them. Is that what you have done? I have, I have my same officer's field, uh, field officer's notebook in my locker. Did you start it? Uh, no, I've had, I've had several different ones, but I usually keep them in my locker. So for the field officer's notebook that you had in May of 2016, that would be in your locker? It should be, yes. How many field officer notebooks have you filled since you've been a police officer? Not many, probably less than, less than five. And do you recall how many, roughly how many pages are in each field officer notebook? I, no, I don't recall. Did you have access to DART? I don't, I don't recall what hours they worked at Central Division. And what did DART stand for? I don't know the specific acronym, but I know it's the domestic violence uh, card. Did you also have access to uh, report, types of reports, incident reports, various forms, diagrams, things of that nature in case you needed them? Yes, I did. And where were, where were those kept while you were on a shift? I'm talking about May 2016. I usually keep uh, extra spare reports in my bag and I also keep them in my vest. So when you answered calls in May of 2016, you had reports material in your vest as you answered calls, is that correct? Yes. It's a deposition exhibit and report. It's a multiple, multiple page document. I'm just asking her if she recognizes this document. Yes, I do. Okay. When is the last time you reviewed this document? About a week ago. All right. And what were the circumstances under which you reviewed this document a week ago? For this testimony. Now, I asked you some questions about uh, the body-worn video. Are you aware of anyone any other officer being assigned your body worn video under your serial number? I'm not aware. Is there any chance that you could be mistaken about when you were assigned body worn video? No, there's not. And why do you say that? Because everything is recorded and documented on evidence.com under my serial number. So if a supervisor wanted to enter the database under my serial number, they could watch my videos and see the specific date and time my videos started to record and when the date of my last video was to this date. Uh, all right. And did you go back and look to see what date you started? I did. What was the date that you were assigned body-worn video equipment in Central Division? 
to the so the first day that i took out body worn video was june 16th of 2016. i'm going to show you this second page of what has been marked as deposition exhibit number one it, it has you summoned to attend and give testimony at a deposition and also to produce certain documents do you recall this being issued yes i do and here we go the documents to be produced um, the first of those was all video footage recorded by you relating to any incident at 849 south broadway los angeles california 90014 on may 21 2016 including all video footage relating to incident number and it has the number on may 21 2016. did you conduct any type of search or or any kind of uh, uh, effort to see if you had any video footage on may 21 2016 relating to this incident uh, the answer is no uh, i'm going to ask you to take did the anyone at the lapd at any point supervisors watch commanders commanders anyone connected with the lapd ever ask you whether you had any video footage from the incident of may 21 2016. no I'm going to ask you to take a look at number two here. It says all documents and or communications, including without limitation, any notes, memoranda, reports, filings, and or summaries relating to any incident at 849 South Broadway, Los Angeles, California, 90014 on May 21, 2016. Are you aware of any documents or communications that would fit this description? No. Now, Officer Signs, you've had training uh, on domestic violence, correct? Correct. Could you tell me what that consists of? We received training in the police academy. A anywhere else? Did you have any other type of domestic violence training other than when you were in the police academy? Other than my experience in the field dealing with domestic violence, no, not that I can recall. And as of May of 2016, would you agree that you had answered over 100 domestic violence calls? About, yeah, we, yeah, I go to, yes, I go to a lot of domestic violence calls every day. And you consider yourself to be a specialist in domestic violence. Is that accurate? I don't, I don't understand the title specialist. I don't consider myself a specialist. In May of 2016, what was the police officer supposed to do when the victim of a domestic violence would not respond to questions or cooperate with pursuing charges after a call was placed and the police officers had arrived? If an individual is uncooperative, we are to check the location to make sure that the suspect isn't hiding for the safety of the potential victim and offer a business card if they decide to speak to us later. In May of 2016, was it your understanding that if you saw evidence of injury or property damage and disarray, that you were to file a report even if the victim was not cooperating? Correct. Pretty sure it was remarked as exhibit number eight. Uh, and this is uh, something that was dated November 24, 2018. It's to all department personnel from the chief of police domestic violence supplemental report form. And it starts out with the domestic violence supplement report form and it has the number of it has been revised to provide a more concise picture of the history and needs of the victim for the purpose of investigating the crime of domestic violence. Was this a document that you would call receiving at some point? Yes. Okay. And do you understand, why, do you have any understanding of why this was supplemented in November 24, 2014? I do not. I'm going to ask you, officer, to take a look at what has been marked as exhibit number nine and it's called Los Angeles Police Department Domestic Violence Supplemental Report. Do you recognize this document? Yes. Okay. And what is your understanding of what this document is? It's a supplemental document that we 
add to a police report for domestic violence. All right. And is this one of the reports that you would carry in your vest when you answered calls? Yes. I'm going to ask you to take a look, uh, if you if you can, at the very left-hand column, where it has a number of different uh, categories here, and it has victim shaking, unresponsive, crying, scared, angry, fearful, and of why these are included on this supplemental domestic violence report. So identify somebody's emotional state during an investigation. Uh, and, and this is specifically with respect to domestic violence, correct? Correct. Okay. And then if you can turn over to the crime scene section on the right hand side, uh, you'll notice that there are some categories that include location vandalized slash ransacked, personal property damage, furniture disarray, broken, um, what is your understanding of why those categories are included in there for making notations for domestic violence supplemental report? To identify the crime scene at the time of the incident. Okay. And was it your understanding that these items that they have on here may be significant in assisting in determining whether there was in fact domestic violence and improving and improving the case? Correct. And I direct your attention specifically to the evidence section. Uh, and it indicates witnesses present during domestic violence, statements taken, evidence collected, uh, photos taken uh, on there. What is your understanding of the significance of this info collecting this information? It's significant to tell a story about what happened at the domestic violence incident. Okay. And then if we can scroll down a little bit further to additional questions, there's a series of those, including has suspect threatened to kill you? Uh, do they possess firearms? Have they ever attempted to smother, strangle, or suffocate you? Uh, and things of that nature. What is your understanding of why you're supposed to ask those questions? Give you a background on the relationship and idea of what the victim and the suspect have been through okay thank you just just let me ask you the question officer science you did not fill out that supplemental report when you responded on may 16 2020 may 21 2016 to the broadway uh call correct with amber heard correct it did not meet criteria the question I asked was, did you fill out one of those forms? No, I did not. I did not mean right here. Officer Science, I'm going to ask you to take a look at what has been marked as exhibit number 10. And if I can direct your attention to the top, it says domestic violence standards of review. And it has field notebook provider domestic violence laws, LAPD form number 18.30.02. Are you familiar with that? Yes. It's, it has case preparation. It says, note the complainant's emotional and physical condition. Do you see that? Yes, I do. And then ensure all evidence is gathered and preserved, e.g. blooded clothing, damaged phones, property. You see that? Yes, I do. And it also says ensure photographs are taken of injuries or lack of injury to complainant and accused and then suggest both the day or two after. What is your understanding of the reasons for collecting this evidence? Because these are fruits of a crime. I, I'm sorry, I didn't- Because these are fruits one. of a crime. If there's a crime, this is important to prove that a crime was committed. And what do you mean by fruits of a crime? If we're talking domestic violence, the location would be evidence. So if there's, you know, a house is a ransacked and that should be noted in the report, that would be considered evidence. All right, then we're gonna to go to the second page here and it has ensure photographs are taken of scene and damaged property, e.g. broken furniture, holes in wall, damaged phones, 
phone car, evidence of alcohol consumption, general disarray. Do you see that? Yes, I do. And what is your understanding of why that would be important? Same thing, proof of a crime. Okay. And then it also says canvas location and interview all witnesses, including children, fresh complaint witnesses, neighbors, and local law enforcement. Do you see that? Yes, I do. And what would be the reason for canvassing the location and interviewing all witnesses? That would be further evidence. And what is your understanding of what fresh complaint means? I wouldn't, I couldn't tell you. Okay. And then if we go down a little bit further, it also has complainant questions. And it has questions such as length and nature of relationship, but also prior incidents of domestic violence reported and unreported, and what form of violence or abuse has taken. Do you see that? Yes, I do. And how long, what is your understanding of why that would be important? Because it gives us an idea and background of their relationship. Okay. And then we go to the next page, and we have a little bit more here. We have the, we went too far. And that says how long the abuse has been occurring, any logs or diaries, is there a pattern of alcohol or substance abuse? What is your understanding of why those would be relevant? Again, because it gives us background on what we're dealing with, what type of relationship this is. And may help with the proof of the crime? Correct. Okay. And then we have identify the person who first saw the complainant after the incident, and it says in parentheses, fresh complaint witness. So I'm kind of guessing that must be the definition. But why would it be important to interview or identify the person who first saw the complainant after the incident? They probably have the best recollection. Okay. And also has identified the person with whom the complainant first spoke about the incident, fresh complaint witness. What is your understanding of why that would be important? Same thing, the best recollection. Okay. And then we have what have neighbors seen or heard. Why would that be important? Because it would prove to us that there was an incident if there was other people with the same story as the victim. Okay. And then we also have did witness observe how physical injury occurred. Why would that be important? Because that would tell us that there was a crime that somebody got injured. And then we have statements by the complainant and or accused after the incident. Why would that be important? Because we're getting our story from the complainant. So what they say is everything with the crime. All right. Let's look at 12 for a moment. This is this is exhibit number 12. It's Office of the Chief of Police, April 9, 2002. And it's a domestic violence victims memo. And it says purpose. The department is legislatively mandated to provide specific information to victims of domestic violence crimes. And then they go in to describe that. What is your understanding of it? Well, let me go a little bit further because I'm not trying to I'm going to try to move through this a little bit quicker. So it says to mitigate this issue, the department has begun to use the victim information notification every day buying pamphlet to accomplish not only the domestic violence information required requirements under Section 13, 701 of the California Penal Code, but also to provide information regarding the buying program. Did you did you have a copy of that pamphlet? Was that something that was given to you? Yes. OK. And was that something that you typically provided then, as it says, you should to victims of domestic violence? Yes. What is your understanding of why you were to provide the pamphlet? Oh, you understand the question? Yes, because it gives resources to the victim, domestic violent resources like shelters and phone numbers to provide help. 
I'm going to show you what has been marked as exhibit number 11. Do you recognize this document? Yes, I do. This is the vine. Okay, when you say vine, is this the pamphlet that yeah. we're being referred to? Okay. And it, it's your understanding that you were supposed to be giving that pamphlet to victims of domestic violence on calls, is that correct? Correct. Did you provide a copy of this pamphlet to Amber Heard? I did not. I did not identify her as a victim of domestic violence. Is that the sole reason why you did not give that to Amber Heard? Yes, we want to give them to victims of domestic violence. I'm going to ask you to take a look. At this point, Your Honor, uh, Ms. Hurd's counsel is asking to move into evidence and publish to the jury Defendant's Exhibit 730, and Mr. Depp has no objection. All right, 730 in evidence, thank you for publish. Keep going. First page of exhibit number three. It's an incident recall uh, from specifically May 21st, 2016. Do you recognize this document? Yes, I do. And what, please explain to me what, what it is. It's a summary of our radio call. All right, and how is this recorded? By dispatch. And how is it communicated to you? A computer in our car. Okay. So I'm going to ask you to take a look at the very beginning of this. It start well. It starts out. It obviously has an incident number. Uh, is this your understanding of the incident recall? for the report to 849 South Broadway involving Amber Heard. Yes. It starts out with 521-16 at 2030-58, which is 830-58 or almost 831. And it says incident initiated by such and such. Uh, do you see that? Yes, I do. Okay. And the next thing that's communicated is Penthouse 3 PR received call from victim's friend Amber, assaulted by boyfriend. PR refused to give further. You see that? Yes, I do. Now, when you were out on the road, did you see that right away, or did you have to look this up later when it was you that was going to respond? We review the calls as we're driving to the to the call. Okay. Then we have at 521, 2037, which is 837, a duplicate call. Do you see that? I do. All right, let's go down to 521, 16. Officer Science, can you go where I just highlighted here? And it's, it's uh, 2057, which would be what time? 857. All right, and it has STAT colon AS. What does that mean? There you go. So would that be when you and Officer Haddon arrived at 849 South Broadway? Correct. And then it has the next entry is 521 2016. It has 21 22 57. So that would be 9 22. Okay, and it says, go ahead, I'll have you read this. What does it say after that? Met with Vic, Chuck Loke, verified husband left Loke, Vic advised verbal. Okay, go ahead into the next, go ahead and go into the next page, or next line, go ahead. Dispute and refuse to give any further info issued business card. Who wrote those two lines? 
I don't recall. And what did that mean to you, those two lines that you just read? It's a, it's a disposition of what happened at the call. Okay, can you, can you tell me what that means? I mean, just tell me in real person's words what those words are. Yeah, that we, we met with the victim. We checked the location. Uh, the husband wasn't there. And that the victim advised us that she just had an argument and that she wasn't going to give us any further information. And because we didn't identify a crime, we issued her a business card letting her know that she could reach out to us later if she changed her mind and wanted to cooperate. Okay. And at what point did you close this incident? Uh, whatever it says on the screen, uh, let's see. 9-22-57. Okay. And what did incident closed mean? That we cleared from the location. We were complete. Done. Okay. Now, if we could go to page, bait stamp number 12. And do you recognize this document? I do. It's a summary of all of our calls from that day. All right. And I believe you testified earlier that you reviewed this document in preparation for this deposition. Is that correct? Yes, I did. Correct. Okay. And if we can go down to right here, that's 922, correct? At the end of that? Correct. All right. And it says 242D domestic violence. What is that? It's a, it's a code for domestic violence. And what does the 242D mean? That's battery. Officer Science, when we broke before the lunch break, I had just asked you about whether you had believed that you were at the penthouse on May 21st, 2016. Uh, for 30 to 60 minutes. Do you recall me asking that? Yes, I do. And do you recall testifying that that's what you thought was the time that you and Officer Haddon spent at the penthouse on May 21st, 2016? Yes, I recall. Okay. And in fact, it was significantly less, correct? Correct. Okay. And in fact, it was uh, you entered from the elevator at 9.04 p.m. and went back into the elevator at 9.19, a total of 15 total minutes, correct? Correct. Okay. And, and we've seen the video clips of you getting on the elevator and getting off, um, and that's where those time stamps come from. Now, once you got off the elevator at 9.04 p.m., uh, the first thing you did was listen for some noise, correct? Correct. All right, and then you went around uh, and checked out the outdoor courtyard to see if anyone was outside. Do you recall that? Yes, I do. And you saw that there was a woman in the gym who was not related to the incident. Do you recall that? Correct. How did you know the woman was not related to the incident? Because she seemed unfazed. She was just working out. Did you speak with her? No, I didn't. Do you recall what she looked like? I don't. Now, did you take any notes during the entire 15 minutes from when you got off the elevator till when you got back on the elevator? From the I did not. Did Officer Haddon, to your knowledge? Not to my knowledge, no. Okay. Did you uh, take pictures or record anything? I did not. So after you saw the woman in the gym and, and looked at the parameter, you went back to the, hall, the hallway and you met with what, what you called a white male who was generic. Do you recall using that term? They asked me to describe him, yes. And, and, and you said generic, correct? Right. And what do you mean by generic? He didn't have any uh, identifying uh, I don't know, nothing that I could remember. He just, I just remember a, a male white, nothing out of the ordinary. What color was his hair? I don't even remember now. 
Did he have facial hair, a beard or a mustache? I don't remember. Do you recall how tall he was roughly? I don't remember anything about him. Did you ask him his name? I don't recall. Okay. Now, the generic white male talked with you. Do you recall that? Yes, I do. And when you first saw Amber Heard, she was crying, red-eyed, and was not making eye contact with you, correct? Correct. And you asked her a few questions, and it was quite clear that she did not want to speak to the police. Is that correct? Correct. Now, Amber Heard was visibly upset, so she would look down. Sometimes she would look up at you when she spoke, but was back and forth, correct? Correct. What was Amber Heard wearing that night? I don't recall. What hairstyle did Amber Heard have that night? I don't recall. Now, when was the first time you were asked to provide details of the events of May 21, 2016? I don't recall. Do you recall providing your testimony at a deposition in July of 2016? Correct. Is that the first time you were asked to provide any details of what your recollection was of the events of May 21, 2016? Correct. Okay. And that was roughly two months later, is that correct? Correct. And how many shifts had you worked in that two-month period? Uh, I'm not aware. I don't know. How many calls had you answered in those two months? I don't know that number. How many of those calls were domestic violence calls in those two months? I don't know that number. And if you saw any signs of injury on Amber Heard, or even just damage to property, would you have been duty bound to make a report? Correct. Now, your recollection is that there was no damage to the the flat you searched the entire flat and there was no damage broken glass or anything out of the ordinary would you agree correct did you see anything did you observe anything out of the ordinary during this particular call that you answered at the penthouse on may 21 2016 i did not when you left that call when you got back into that elevator do you recall what you were thinking? I remember being impressed by the, the penthouse, how big and beautiful it was, yes. But anything else? No, nothing. And, and just so we can stay on that for a minute, you did not, you had not heard of Amber Heard at the time of this report, right? On May 21st, 2016? Correct. But you did know that Johnny Depp was an actor, correct? Correct. And you didn't know that that was Johnny Depp's penthouse when you reported there, correct? Correct. But you, as you just said, were impressed with the penthouse. Would it be fair to say you thought probably somebody with some wealth lived there? Correct. Can you bring up plaintiff's exhibit number 23? Officer Sides, do you recognize this elevator at all? Yes, I do. What do, you, what do you recall? That's the elevator from the location. Okay. Uh, Alex, I'm going to ask you to go to 21-19-40. And as you're moving that, Officer Sides, I'm going to ask you to take a look at this and see if you can tell me what you are saying to Officer Haddon in this video clip. That's you, is that correct? Correct. And Officer Haddon, do you recognize? Correct. Officer Sides, can you tell what you were saying to Officer Haddon? I cannot. Does it look like you might have said at the beginning that was crazy? I can't tell what I was saying. Would you agree, though, that you were quite animated in your discussion with Officer Haddon? No, I wouldn't agree. How would you describe your demeanor? Calm. Okay. Thank you. 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 Thank you
comfortably talking to my partner. All right, I'm going to ask you to take a look at plaintiff's exhibit number 17. And while Alex is bringing that up, so your best recollection is that you saw no injuries on Amber Heard, correct? Correct. And your best recollection is you saw no property damage, nothing in disarray, nothing out of the ordinary, correct? Correct. And if you had seen either of those, you would have had to file a report, correct? Correct. Officer Sines, let me ask you this question. So we've established that you got off the elevator on the penthouse level at 9.04 p.m. Do you recall that? Yes, I do. Do you recognize the person here? Yes, I do. Amber Heard. Okay. And do you see any signs of injury on Amber Heard's face in this picture? I do not. Is it your testimony that you do not perceive this cheek to be reflecting an injury on Amber Heard? Correct. No injury. I'm going to ask you to take a look at this section here above the eyelid. And now I think with the, I'm going to ask you to take a look at that eyelid. Is it your perception that that eyelid does not reflect an injury? I'm sorry, what was your answer, Officer Sines? Correct. No injury. Okay. And then up above on the forehead level where the redness is and it looks like there's a couple of bumps, is it your perception that does not reflect an injury? Correct. Officer Sines, I'm going to ask you to look at what has been marked as deposition exhibit number 18, close to the time that you alighted from the elevator, correct? Correct. Please describe for me what you see in this photograph. I see a striped carpet with discoloration on the right-hand side of the photo. And what I perceive as, I don't know if that's a reflection, some sort of mark. Now, you believed and testified, in fact, that you considered the hallways to be very well lit that night, correct? Correct. Did you see this, these stains? No, not that I recall. All right. Do you, would you agree that there are, those are reddish stains on the right side? Correct. What does it look like from your experience? Like a stain, like from a, like a liquid. Red wine, possibly? It could be, yes. Okay. But you don't recall seeing that in the hallway after you got off the elevator? I do not. And you did not investigate this or take any pictures or record anything about it, correct? Correct. Okay. Now, let's go to number 19. Do you recognize what is depicted in exhibit number 19? Yes, it's our business card. And it has 1A1 on the front of it. What is that? That's our unit designation. And then it has Haddon and a badge number. Is that his badge number? That is his serial number. Okay. Serial number, thank you. And it has your name, and is that your serial number? Correct. Who wrote this on the card? I don't recall. Would it have been either you or Officer Haddon? Correct. Do you recognize your handwriting? I can't tell from this. Now, I think you indicated when you were looking at the incident recall and the CAD summary that a business card had been left. Do you recall that? Yes, I do. And why did you leave a business card? I advised Amber Heard that she could contact us at any time if she changed her mind and decided that she wanted to speak to us and cooperate. All right. Let's go to number 20. Do you recognize this? What's been depicted in this picture? Yes, I do. It's the back of the business card. All right. And it says 5-21-2016, and the time is 9-16 p.m. Is that the time that it was written? Correct. Okay. And do you recognize the handwriting on this side? Yes, I do. Okay. Now, let's go to number 21. 
It looks like my handwriting. Okay. Now it says radio call of dispute. Do you see that? I do. Um, did did why didn't you put verbal dispute? It didn't. Verbal dispute, dispute. It's the same. It's the same thing to me. And you have refused report on here, correct? Correct. Could you just read the, this next part that you wrote on here? Sure. Advice can call at later time if change his mind because she was uncooperative and didn't want to speak to us. Okay. Now, why did you say if change his mind? Because I was giving her the opportunity to have a resource if she changed her mind. But if Amber Heard had no injuries and there was no evidence of any type of physical uh, property issues, uh, disarray, breakage, etc., cetera, um, then why would it matter if she changed her mind? It's a courtesy that I, I, I choose to give people when I go to calls. Now, if Amber Heard had called you later, you had already closed this out and had not written a report and had taken no notes, correct? Correct. But if I'm understanding your earlier testimony, that if you saw evidence of injury, or if you saw injury of uh, uh, evidence of property damage, even if the victim did not cooperate, you would write a report, correct? Correct. And we'll go to number 21. Officer Sainz, this is just a uh, picture. Do you recognize you and Officer Haddon here? Yes, I do. Okay, um, Officer Sainz, is the timestamp on here of 9.19 p.m., 49 p.m., does that comport with your recollection of when you left? I don't recall what time I left. I'm just going based on the video that is in front of me. Okay, do you have any reason to believe that's incorrect? I don't. Officer Sainz, I'm gonna ask you to take a look at exhibit number 24. Okay. Do you recognize the person in this photo? Yes, Amber Heard. Okay. Do you perceive uh, there to be an injury or evidence of injury on Amber's face in this photo? No, no I do not. Uh, what is your uh, perception of the redness on the cheek and the eyelid and above the eyebrow? It's consistent when I observe her crying, she's fair skin, her face is flush. I'm going to ask you to look at what has been marked as exhibit number 25. Do you recognize this as Amber Heard? Yes, I do. Do you see a red mark on Amber Heard's cheek and above her eyelid and above her eyebrow on this picture? Her face looks flush, yes, redness. Okay, and what is your perception of what that is caused by. Like I said earlier, it's consistent with what I've seen her crying. Sure. But you don't think it's consistent with a cell phone being thrown at her? Correct. It does not look like an injury caused from a cell phone. Okay. And why not? Because it's consistent with somebody crying. Her face is flushed. This was taken at, on May 21st. I'm going to ask you to look at what has been marked as exhibit number 26. It was, do you recognize this as Amber Heard? Yes, I do. Oh, sorry. Officer Sainz, do you see any redness on Amber Heard's cheek and above her eyelid? And you know, we'll go with those. I do. And what is your perception of what the cause of those is, those red marks? consistent with her crying, her face is flushed. And is it fair to say that you do not believe that this reflects an injury? Correct. And, it, and, and would it also be fair to say that you would not consider it sufficient to investigate further, whether it's an injury? There is nothing that would stop me from investigating. I would continue to ask her questions and it's up to the victim if they want to cooperate. But just so that we were clear here, even if the victim doesn't cooperate, if you see signs of injury, you still 
and I believe you testified to this, believe yourself duty bound to write a report, correct? Yes. Okay. But in your mind, you don't perceive this as to be reflective of an injury. Is that correct? Correct. And I'm going to ask you to take a look at exhibit number 27. Again, do you recognize this as Amber Heard? Yes. Okay. okay. And do you see redness on the cheek of Amber Heard on this one? Yes, I do. All right. And then you had testified on a number of these other pictures and on this one as well, that this is consistent with crying. Do you see any redness on Amber's other cheek? Yes, I do. Is it the same or similar to the redness on the cheek, on the right cheek? Based on this photo, it looks like one cheek is redder than the other. But you also don't see any swelling with that? Correct. I'm going to ask you to take a look at what has been marked as exhibit number 28. Do you recognize this as Amber Heard? Yes, I do. Okay. And do you see redness on the right cheek and above the eye? Yes, I do. And is it your perception that this reflects any type of, or could reflect any type of injury? No. Why not? Because my perception is it was consistent with her crying. All right, let's take this down to 29. I'm going to ask you the same questions. Do you recognize this as Amber Heard? Yes. And do you see any redness in the right cheek and above the eyelid? Yes. Okay. And is it your perception that these are not indicative of injury? Yes. And what is your reasoning? It's consistent with her crying. Let's take this one down. Let's go to number 30. Now, you testified earlier that you thoroughly searched the penthouse. Do you recall that testimony? Yes, I do. Okay. And Josh Drew, the gentleman that you called the generic male, actually took you through, escorted you through the penthouse and the series of penthouses, correct? Correct. Officer Sines, did you or did you not thoroughly search the penthouses on May 21st, 2016? We did search the penthouse. Okay. And you used the term thoroughly, did you not? I don't recall. Okay. Do you feel like you conducted a thorough search of the penthouses that night? Yes, I did. I did a sweep of the location for the suspect. Okay. And when you're talking about a sweep of the location, did you go through every room? Yes, every room. Okay. And was there anyone escorting you through those rooms? Yes, the same male that we were met with at the beginning of the call. That you called the generic male, correct? Correct. Now, you also testified a little earlier that this was a very nice series of penthouses, right? Yes. Did you interview the woman that was sitting with Amber Heard? I attempted to. All parties were uncooperative. What did you say to the woman that was with Ms. Heard? I don't recall the exact words, but I introduced myself to everyone and asked if they seen what happened or know what happened, and they all refused to speak to me. Did you ask for their names? I recall, yes, I did ask for their names. Nobody would give me their names. Now, that's a little unusual, isn't it? No, it's not. A lot of people don't like us. Well, is it that they don't like you, or is it potentially that they don't want to, with a domestic violence situation, are reluctant to press charges? Every situation is different. Based on my training experience where I work, it's usually that people do not like us. Do you have a recollection of what the woman who was with Amber Heard looks like? No recollection. Do you know what color hair she had? I have zero recollection. 
So you don't recall how old she was, how tall she was, what her hairstyle was, what she was wearing, anything about her? Zero recollection. But somehow you're sure you tried to interview her and she refused to answer questions? Yes, it's common practice. I, I try to interview everyone during my investigation. So did you pull out your notebook at any time while you were in the penthouse? I did not. I had nothing to write. No one would speak to me. Well, how did you know that when you started asking the questions that they weren't going to give an answer? Because they just looked at me. But wouldn't you pull out your notebook first and then ask the questions? Then write down the answers as they're giving them to you? No, I don't put anything in my hands for officer safety issues until I'm sure that I have something to Sorry. Ask. I'm sorry, officer. Can you repeat your answer? I don't put anything in my hands for officer safety reasons. If I'm not sure I'm going to write, I keep my hands free. When I ask the questions, I got no answers. Therefore, I didn't take out any notebooks or pens. Did you have any reason to fear for your safety at the time that you were talking with Amber Heard and the woman with her? I always fear for my safety. A potential suspect could have been in the house. So yes, I. my guard was not down if that's what you're asking. Wait, what did you do first? Did you look at the throughout the house to ensure that the person wasn't there or did you ask the questions first and then look at the house? I attempted to ask questions first. I can't just go into a house and start checking it without asking questions. So what questions did you ask first? I don't recall specific questions. Do you recall any of your questions? I don't. Do you recall any of the answers that you were given? I don't recall. Now, we went through the domestic violence supplemental report and some of the guidelines for officers on domestic violence. Do you recall that the crime scene, a number of the items reflected location ransacked, location vandalized, furniture in disarray, uh, personal property damage? Do you remember those being? items as the checklist for pro for crime scene for domestic violence? As they pertain to domestic violence reports, yes, I do. Right. Now, you, you, did you ever speak with the two officers who answered the second call to the townhouse that night? I did not. Did you ever communicate in any manner with the two officers who answered the second call to the penthouse? I did not. Did you communicate through a third party to the second set of officers relating to the domestic violence call in your determination? I did not. Did you know the two officers who responded no. to the second call? Did I'm not. Sorry. Do you know who they are to this day? I do not. Have you ever spoken to the other two officers about uh, uh, about the responding to this call on May 21st, 2016? I have not. Have you ever spoken with anyone else about your response and their response to this call on May 21st, 2016? I have not. And just so everybody's aware, up until now, you've been listening to question from questioning from Ms. Hurd's counsel. At this point, I believe we're going to shift over to questioning from Mr. Depp's counsel. I want you to focus on um, the date of the incident that uh, we have been talking about during this deposition, and that is uh, May 21st, 2016. Uh, I'll refer to that as the date of the incident. Um, do you understand what I mean when I say date of the incident? Yes, I do. Okay. So as of the date of the incident, for how long had had you uh, been a training officer? Since I believe the end of November of 2015. So between six to eight months? Yes. Prior to the date of the incident, for how long had you been a training officer? Uh, four to six months. Okay. And uh, as of the date of the incident, approximately how many um, 
incidents of domestic violence have you uh, come across? I couldn't tell you. I've, I mean, I believe you said hundreds. Yes, that's how I understood it from uh, testimony I read in previous depositions of yours. So it, it, it's in the hundreds? Yes. Okay. Now, when you, uh, and you indicated that um, you proceeded to the incident um, at the Eastern Columbia building uh, due to uh, what you heard from dispatch, is that correct? Correct. And do you recall as you sit here today uh, what you were told from dispatch that led you to the Eastern Columbia building on the date of the incident? I don't have an independent recollection. Do you, as you sit here today, do you recall that it had something to do um, uh, with a dispute at that location? Correct. Okay. And when you first arrived at the scene of the incident, uh, what did you first do on entering the building? We met with a security guard in the lobby who escorted us to the elevator. Did you ask that security guard any questions about uh, the building? Sorry, that suggest that security guard any questions? Not that I recall. Did the security guard uh, escort you up to the penthouse? They gave us access through the elevator. I do not believe that they came up to the penthouse with us. I believe they just accessed the elevator. Okay. And when you arrived at the uh, penthouse and exited the elevator, was it just you and your partner, Mr. Haddon? Officer Haddon? Yes. Okay. And what did you do next? We tried to listen for any kind of sounds of domestic violence. We checked the hallways. We didn't observe anyone. Went out to a courtyard, didn't observe anyone. And based on what I was just reminded of, there was a woman in the gym who didn't seem involved, was working out, looked fine, nothing out of the ordinary. And then we responded to a door in the hallway and I knocked and was met by a male. Okay. Up until that point of time, from exiting the elevator to knocking on that door, did you see anything that indicated a crime? I did not. Up until the point where you knocked on that door, um, did you see, see or hear or witness anything indicating that there had been a domestic violence perpetrated? I did not. Up until you knocked on that door, did you see anything uh, with, which you would have considered out of the ordinary? I did not. And I guess what I'm asking is, walking from the elevator to the gym and then to the door that you knocked on, um, what, was that, was that, were you in the hallway? Yes, I was in the hallway. Okay. And during that time period from exiting the elevator through to knocking on the door, um, was there anything in the hallway that uh, was unusual to you? Not that I observed, no. Did you see any uh, stains on the floor? Not that I recall. Did you see any uh, vandalism in that area? No, I did not. Did you see uh, any broken glass in that area? I did not. Okay. And upon knocking on the door, what happened next? A male opened the door. I don't remember the exact questions and conversation we had, but I remember asking if they called for help and he said that 
it was the neighbor and that she was inside of his house apartment with his girlfriend. And I asked him if they could step out and he told me to wait and he shut the door and we waited. Uh, we waited for them to exit. I don't remember how much time passed by and they came out and that's when we were met with his girlfriend and who I know now as Miss Heard uh, in the hallway. And up until that point in time, did you hear anything that led you to believe uh, that a crime had been committed? I did not. Up until that point in time, did you see anything that made you believe that a crime had been committed? I did not. Up until, up until that point in time, did you hear anything that made you believe that there had been an act of domestic violence there? I did not. Up until that point in time, did you see anything that made you believe that there had been an act of domestic violence there? I did not. Okay. So you indicated that um, after you knocked on the door, uh, you spoke with and you spoke with a gentleman, is that correct? Correct. And you previously testified to uh, someone as a generic white male. Is that the same person? Yes. So your previous testimony when you were referring to a generic white male, that's the person who, who opened the door when you first knocked on it, correct? Yes, there was only one male at the location besides my partner. And there was only one male, is that for the entire time you're at the location? Yes. So in the hall, uh, you met with the generic white male, Miss Heard, and the generic white male girlfriend, is that right? Yes. And it was just those three folks? Correct. And you were there with uh, your partner, Officer Haddon? Correct. Okay. And how, in the hallway, how far were you standing from Miss Heard? Uh, it was close, probably like two to five feet. Okay. And at that time, did you notice any injuries on this herd? I did not. Okay. Uh, were you looking to see if she had any injuries at that time? Yes, I was. And, um, so you were looking to see if Ms. Heard had any injuries and you determined that she did not. Is that accurate? Correct. Okay. And was the lighting good enough in the hallway for you to make that determination? Yes, the hallways was well lit. Okay. And at the time, were you wearing any sort of corrected lenses? I was not. Okay. Uh, Although you were not wearing corrective lenses, were you prescribed corrective lenses at the time? No, I have never worn glasses and I'm not prescribed. I have good vision. Okay. And at that time, uh, did you have good vision? Yes, I did. At the time you were uh, observing Ms. Heard, uh, did you have good vision? Yes, I did. And did you observe any injuries at that time? I did not. What did you ask Ms. Heard at that time, if anything? I don't have an independent recollection. Again, it's been so long. I, I don't remember specific questions. Okay. Now, let me just back up a little bit. Um, during the time period from when you left the elevator and uh, when Ms. Heard came onto the hallway, at any time, did the generic white male tell you that there had been an act of domestic violence? No, he did not. Did he tell you anything that made you think there may have, may have been an act of domestic violence? No, he did not. Did he tell you anything that made you believe that, that uh, a crime may have been committed? No, he did not. And during that time period, did you ask him um, what had happened or what was happening? Yes, I did ask him and he just refused to give me any information. Okay. Okay. So now, uh, 
fast forward to what we were talking about with respect to uh, you in the hallway with the generic white male misheard and the generic white male's girlfriend. Um, after you observed her and saw no sign of injury, what did you do next? I advised her that we would be conducting a protective sweep just to make sure that there was no one else in the house. And she agreed if her neighbor, the male, could accompany us with the protective suite. Okay. Up until that point in time, uh, did you ask Ms. Heard what happened? Yes, I did. And what was her response? No response. She was uncooperative. And an officer signed at that time was Ms. Heard cooperative? Ms. Heard was uncooperative. Thank you. Um, and by uncooperative, does that mean that when you asked her a question, she wouldn't say a word? Did she say something that made you think she was not cooperating? She wouldn't say anything. Okay. But just to be clear, you would ask questions and she wouldn't say anything? Correct. Okay. And what did you do at that point? After the protective sweep, I asked her again if she wanted to talk to me, if anything happened. Again, I don't remember the specific questions that I asked her, but I asked her questions to establish if there was some sort of crime, who was involved, and again, she wouldn't give me any information. I, asked, I attempted to ask her friend, uh, the other woman in the room, I even asked the males to wait in the hallway so it could just be us women in there so we could talk privately. Maybe she felt more comfortable that way. Still, they denied that there was any crime. They wouldn't answer any specific questions. So I wrote a business card. I advised her if she changed her mind that she could call us at any time and we would respond to help her out. So backing up a bit to the time you were in the hallway with the three of them, and you testified that Ms. Heard was uncooperative, um, and then you indicated you did a sweep. I want to start with from the point of time in the hallway where she was uncooperative, trans transitioning to the sweep. How did that occur? Did you ask her if you could look at in the penthouses? How, how did this? How did you go from standing in the hallway to conducting a sweep? I, I don't recall. Now, before you, before you swept the penthouses, um, did you ask if you could enter the penthouses? Yes, I did. Okay. And who? And what was the response? I, I can't remember if she gave me a response or nodded her head. I. I can't remember. From what you observed or heard from Ms. Heard, uh, you took it that she was permitting you to enter the penthouses and look around. Is that accurate? Correct. Okay. Um, was it more than one penthouse? There was, yes, there was two. Okay. And this term sweep we've been using, is that a technical police officer term? Yes. yes. What do you mean by conducting a sweep? It's called a protective sweep, and we do so to make sure that there's no other individuals that may be victims that are hurt inside of the location or suspects hiding, concealing themselves from officers uh, that would attack the victim after we left the location. So we go in to verify that any potential suspects are gone from the location for the victim's safety. Okay. Thank you. And you conducted a protective sweep of two penthouses, correct? Correct. What was your understanding of who owned or lived in the first penthouse that you performed a protective sweep on? It was my understanding that Amber heard that it was her home. Again, the, okay. the gentleman directed us. That's why he came with us. So we wouldn't get lost. I, I see. And during your protective sweep during 
the first pen of the first penthouse um did anybody accompany you during the entire sweep yes the male the only male that was there besides my partner okay and your partner conducted the sweep with you correct okay and as to the protective sweep of the first penthouse did you um, go into every room of the penthouse to my knowledge yes and was your knowledge based on uh, the generic white male leading you around Correct. was it your understanding that uh, you did your protective sweep um, included you looking in every room in the penthouse correct during the protective sweep of the first penthouse um, did you see anything that led you to believe that a crime had been committed i did not during the protective sweep of the first penthouse did you hear anything that made you think a crime had been committed i did not during the first protective sweep did you see anything that made you think that an act of domestic violence had occurred i did not during the protective sweep of the first penthouse did you um, hear or see anything i'm sorry did you hear or see anything that made you believe an act of domestic violence had occurred i did not okay upon your completion of the sweep protective sweep of the first penthouse up until that point in time um, from you exiting the elevator up until that point in time did you hear or see anything that made you believe that a crime had been committed i did not up until that point in time did you hear or see anything that made you think an act of domestic violence had occurred i did not now i want to ask you you testified that um, you testified to you um, viewing Ms. Heard and not seeing any signs of injury. Did you view her again after that first viewing? During the interviews and throughout the entire investigation, I'm constantly scanning her and watching. So I, if I see any other observations that would indicate any injury or domestic violence, and did you see anything like that? I did not. And you didn't see, did you see anything like that during the, entire, during the entire time period that you were on that call? And do you believe that you um, had enough time viewing Ms. Heard to determine whether or not uh, she had sustained any injury? Uh, yes, I do. And you deter and did you determine that she sustained any injuries? I determined that she did not sustain any injuries. So other than the conversation you had with her in the hallway when you first got there, did you have any other conversations with Ms. Hurd? I did. Inside of the inside of the lost or penthouse, sorry. Okay. Was that before or after the protective sweep sweep? I believe both before and after I attempted. Okay. okay. How many conversations, separate conversations did you have with Ms. Hurd? I, I don't recall. Okay. There was at least the one in the hallway and there was one uh, before or after the protective sleep, correct? I'm sorry, I missed that answer. Correct. Okay. And during the second conversation you had with her after the one in the hallway how close were you to her the same two to five feet she was right in front of me would you were you close enough to get a good view uh, to determine whether or not she had any injuries yes i was okay and during that second conversation did you determine whether or not she had any injuries i determined that she did not have any injuries at any point in time during the incident, during the date of the incident, uh, did she complain of any injury? She did not. During the protective sweep of the penthouse, 
Did you see anything in disarray? I did not. Okay. Now, you indicated, oh, let me ask you, did you do a protective sweep of the second penthouse? Yes, I did. Okay. Did uh, the generic white male accompany you, accompany you on that sweep as well? Yes, he did. What was your understanding of who owned or resided in that second penthouse? I had no idea. Okay. Um, did you, during that second protective sweep, did you walk through every room in that penthouse? From my understanding, yes, we did. Okay. And during that second protective sweep, did you see anything that you would say was in disarray? I did not. During that second protective sweep, did you see anything that made you believe there had been a crime committed? I did not. During that second protective sweep, did you hear anything that made you think a crime had been committed? I did not. During your protective sweep of the second penthouse, did you see anything that made you believe an act of domestic violence had occurred? I did not. During the protective sweep of the second second penthouse, did you hear or see anything that made you believe um, a crime had been committed? I did not. After you performed the second protective, I'm sorry, after you performed the protective sweep, sweep of the second penthouse, what did you do? I re-responded to where Amber Heard was. And I again tried to see if I could get any information from her. I was unsuccessful. And then I issued her the business card and let her know that she could call us back if she wanted to talk. Did she answer any of your questions? No, she did not. At any point in time during the entirety of the incident, did Ms. Heard answer any of your questions? No, she did not. During the entire time of the incident, did Ms. Heard complain of any injury? No, she did not. During the entirety of your time at the incident, did anybody say anything that made you believe a crime had been committed? No, they did not. During the entirety of the time you were at the incident, did anybody say anything that made you believe an act of, an act of domestic violence had occurred? No, they did not. Okay. During the entirety of your time at the incident, did you see anything that made you believe a crime had occurred? I did not. During the, during the entirety of your time at the incident, did you hear anything that made you believe a crime had been committed? I did not. During the entirety of your time at the incident, did you hear or see anything that made you believe an act of, an act of domestic violence had occurred? I did not. Had you heard of anybody by the name of Miss Heard at that time? Never. Amber Heard? No, I have never heard of Amber Heard before that time. Okay. okay. recognize any of the people that you encountered uh, during the incident? I did not. At the time of the incident, did you have any reason to believe that anybody you encountered at the incident uh, was famous? I did not. And during the entire time that you were at the penthouses during the incident, um, did you have any reason to believe that Mr. Depp was affiliated uh, or involved uh, in the incident? I did not. Uh, Madam Reporter, can you uh, repeat my last question? I lost uh, where I was.
Question, Dur during the entire time you were at the penthouses during the incident, did you witness any bruises on this herd? And there was not a response. I did not observe any injuries on this herd. Okay. Did you observe any swelling on this herd's face? I did not. Did you observe anything that led you to believe that she was a victim of domestic violence? Yes, I did not. Alex, if you can pull up uh, exhibit two. So is this going to be exhibit 57? Uh, yeah. Okay. Officer signs, do you recall having your, having your deposition taken on July 18, 2016 in connection with um, Mr. Depp and Ms. Heard? Yes. Okay. Um, and do you recall um, giving testimony in connection with that deposition under oath? Is there a yes? I'm sorry, officer. Yes. Okay. And did you give accurate and true testimony at that time? Yes. Okay. And you understood you were under oath, correct? Correct. Okay. Alex, if you can go to page 26. Officer Signs, do you recall testifying as to, um, do you recall testifying that, and I'm talking about today, do you recall just testifying that you can't recall what Ms. Heard said to you, if anything? I do not have an independent recollection, but I can go off what I'm seeing here on my screen. Okay. Uh, Your Honor, we're, we're at five o'clock. It looks like we have about uh, 18 minutes left. Do you want to? You don't have any problem finishing it tonight. Do you? Let's go ahead and finish it. Okay. Thank you. And do you agree with me that your memory of the uh, day of the incident was fresher on July 18, 2016 than it is today? Yes, that is correct. Okay. And the incident was May 21st, 2016. This deposition was taken July 18th, 2016. How long after the incident was this deposition taken? Uh, a few months. Okay. And Alex, if I could have control. delayed out is that can that be fixed or is that just the way it is uh this is alex speaking uh yeah i'm afraid i can't uh help that i'm sorry mr preciado that's fine well, officer signs i'm gonna start here do you see my cursor yes i do okay i'm gonna start here at line three the question is okay but we'll get back to that before you did a, a sweep or a check of the rest of, of the penthouse, did you have an opportunity to speak with Ms. Heard when you were in the apartment? Answer, yes, I did. Okay, question, okay, can you tell us about that conversation? Answer, sure. I asked her what happened, opening question. She said nothing, and she continued to cry. I said, who do you live with? Who do you live here with? She shook her head as if she did not want to answer. 
I asked her, are you hurt? Do you need an ambulance? And she shook her head again, no. At that point, I asked her if she mind, if she would mind if I checked her apartment. And that's when she said no. Officer, does this refresh your recollection of the conversation you had with Ms. Hurd at that time? Yes, it does. And the, your testimony that I just read, is that true and accurate? Yes, it is. During the entire time period, you were at the penthouses um, on May 21st, 2016. Did Ms. Hurd say that she had been assaulted in any way by anybody? No, she did not. During your protective sweep of the two penthouses, did you view anything that you would characterize as vandalism? I did not. During the entire time you were at the penthouses on May 21st, 2016, were you looking for any probable cause to believe that a crime had been committed? Yes, I was. And what did you determine? I determined there was no crime. Did you, what did you determine with respect to an assessment of probable cause? There was no probable cause of any sort of crime. Thank you. During the entire time you were at uh, the penthouses on May 21st, 2016, were you wearing any body-worn video cameras? I was not. Are you certain of that? I am certain. And how are you? how is it that you are certain of that? Because I didn't start using body-worn video until June of 2016. And that's after uh, the date of the incident, correct? Correct. Alex, if you would mind putting Exhibit 9 back up. Officer Signs, you were shown this document earlier. What is this document? It is a domestic violence supplemental report. And do you recall uh, counsel asked you about 
the victim column and the crime scene column? Yes, I do recall. Um, do you also see that there's a suspect column in the middle? Yes. Okay. And is there any difference between the victim column and the suspect column with respect to uh, the terms, the terms, um, the box terms? No difference. Did you fill out one of these forms in connection with your investigation on May 21st, 2016? I did not. Why not? Because it was determined there was no crime. And officer signs just uh, one more question with respect to that exhibit nine. I know it's not up, but the, the fact that you did not fill out that form, uh, is that, um, consistent with your training yes it is i wouldn't fill that out because there was no crime it doesn't it's not called for when you testified uh during the london trial uh at the time did you believe your testimony was accurate yes i do um, at all times you testified um under a in any legal proceedings, trials, depositions, uh, do you always give accurate and truthful testimony? Yes, I do. And do you have any reason to not give accurate and truthful testimony in connection with uh, this deposition? I do not. Officer signs, do you see uh, these two pictures? Yes, I do. Um, do you recognize the person in the pictures? Yes, Amber Heard. In both pictures? Yes. Do you see a, a difference in these two pictures, between these two pictures? Yes, I, I do the lighting of the photos. Okay. Do you see any difference in connection with uh, the redness on the cheeks of Ms. Heard as between these two pictures? Yes, I do. The, the left side is the photo's brighter. Other than that, would you agree with me that these two pictures are the same? In other words, um, Ms. Hurd's face, uh, the position of her face, uh, everything about um, her in these pictures is identical except for the differences that you indicated? Yes. Okay. Even though these are the same pictures, do you see any difference with respect to the redness um, in on Ms. Hurd's face with respect to the two pictures? Yes, the photo on the left is brighter, causing the redness on the cheeks to what appears to be brighter or exaggerated. What does it say with respect to, uh, let's, let's concentrate on the picture on the left. Can you read for me what it says in the little box at the very top on the left um, under add a title? Do you see a date and a timestamp? Yes, I see it. What's it say? Date and timestamp? Date is May 21st, 2016. Timestamp is 9.25.12 p.m. And now let's look at the other picture, exhibit 29, at the same spot. Can you read for, for me the, what the timestamp says there? Yes, it says uh, May 21st, 2016, 9.25.12 p.m. So both exhibits, both pictures have the same exact timestamp, correct? Correct. And even though that's the case, do you still believe that there's a difference between the two pictures as you previously described? Yes, I do. Three signs, do you see the word 41? Yes. 
Do you recall council asking the question? Yes. During your uh, protective sweep of the two penthouses on May 21st, 2016, did you see anything in disarray? No. Uh, signs. Um, I think you answered this, but up until up until the present, for how long have you been a LA Los Angeles police officer? I will be going on 12 years. Officer signs. Uh, in connection with your investigation uh, at the. Eastern Columbia building on May 21st, 2016. Uh, were you in a rush in any way? Yes. Complete I'm investigation? No. Were you willing to stay as long as necessary to determine if a crime had been committed? Yes. At any point in time during your investigation on May 21st, 2016 at the penthouses, did Ms. Heard ask you to file a report? No. Did anybody uh, that you spoke with or saw on May 21st, 2016 at the penthouses ask you to file a report? No. Did you have any cause uh, to file a report? No. And was that determination in line with your training? Yes. If you had witnessed anything that led you to believe that an act of domestic violence had occurred, would you have filed a report? Yes. And you, in fact, did not file a report, correct? Yes. Correct. And if you had witnessed something that led you to believe that an act of domestic violence had occurred, um, would you have filed a report even if Ms. Hurd had asked you not to? Yes. And is that, in line, is that in line with your training? Yes. Officer Sainz, you were asked some questions. And just so everybody's on the same page, we have about a minute and a half of questions from Ms. Hurd's counsel at this point. When you were, uh, got off the uh, elevator in the penthouse and when you got on and how much time you spent at the penthouse level, I approached it in my earlier, but based on the cross-examination, I feel like we need to go back to that. Um, so I'm going to ask you to take a look at what is exhibit number six. And do you recognize you and Officer Haddon in this picture? Yes. Okay. And what time does the timestamp on this uh, picture say from the elevator? It says 210443. Okay, that's 90443. Would that be right, PM? Yes. And we looked at this earlier. I'm going to ask you to take a look at it again at 21. And so this one has what time? 211949. All right. And allowing for, in your, and Officer Signs, you said earlier that you weren't sure whether there were accuracies or inaccuracies in terms of the elevators but allowing for that there may be any issues at all, would you agree that it still means that you were on and off that elevator in 15 minutes? Assuming the times are correct, yes. Okay. You were asked uh, to look at a number of the pictures that I had shown you earlier that were taken on the night of May 21st, 2016, both before, during, and after the time that you and Officer Haddon had reported to uh, the uh, 
to Ms. Hurd's penthouse. Do you recall seeing those again and being asked about them? Yes. You were asked by counsel for Mr. Depp to take a look at those again, correct? Correct. Okay. And he asked you if you had seen any of those photographs before and you indicated that you had not, correct? Correct. So other than what was placed in the CAD summary by either you or Officer Haddon and then also went into the incident recall, are you aware of any documentation that either you or Officer Haddon collected relating in any manner to your visit to the penthouse on May 21, 2016? No. All right. Thank you. All right, ladies and gentlemen, that concludes the testimony for today. Please do not do any outside research and don't talk to anybody about the case. We'll see you tomorrow morning. Okay. Thank you. All right. I still have some outstanding exhibits. So if you could get with Jamie and see which ones those are so we can get that taken care of so we don't get backwards and we keep up. All right. All right. We'll see you in the morning. All right. Thank you. Thank you.